I was just talking with Minister Chang in uh, back while we were waiting to to get started. Um, and it's a time where there's a considerable amount of uncertainty, uh, both in Korea and in Washington. We've, um, we've just elected a new president-elect who has said rather curious things about our allies, um, implying that we're only in Korea to help Korea. We're not there for ourselves, that we're there to help Korea. Um, you know, that's just, that's just completely wrong. Um, America has been in Korea because we've felt our strategic national interests are at risk if the Korean environment is uncertain. So we made a commitment as a nation to stay there because our interests require that we stay there. And we chose to have a very strong ally in the Republic of Korea because it helped us do that. This isn't a gift that we're giving to the Korean people. This is something we're doing for ourselves. And we're so very fortunate that we have such a strong ally. We're very grateful to have an ally like this. And so I think it's confusing. We need to talk more clearly to the American people so that they understand why do we have this relationship with Korea? What, why is it important? Um, and there's also some confusing things going on in Korea <laughs> right now. It's a rather uh, unsettled time. Um, I don't know enough about the issues that are swirling around in Korea uh, to know what to say, other than we want a strong Korea through the next election. There'll be, the, the people will make a choice in the next election. I don't know who that will be, but we certainly want a strong Korea during the next year. I think this is going to be an important and maybe dangerous year. And we need to make sure that there is a strong, coherent government in Korea. That's in our interests, again. So, so this is a time of some considerable uncertainty. And what I... Personally, very, one of the reasons I'm very grateful that Minister Chang would keep it on his calendar uh, to come and be with us because at a time like this when there is so much uncertainty, uncertainty here and uncertainty in Seoul, we fall back on the foundations that reassure us. And that foundation is our relationship with each other through so many years. We've, uh, it's not always been a, uh, a clear, uh, it's not always been a relationship that was free of controversy. We've had moments where there have been difficulties in this relationship, but it was always the foundation of that, this partnership that we have with each other that's carried us through it. And that's going to be the same thing here today. Um, so I welcome all of you. I realize I got out of in front here. I was supposed to let you guys were supposed to uh, get it started <laughs> rather than me. But, uh, but if it's okay, I'll just keep going <laughs> since we're doing this. Uh, I'm very, very pleased that we have a chance. This is a new opportunity for us um, uh, to host this conference with Minister Chang and the ministry. Uh, this is a new thing for Korea. And it's, uh, and Korea is stepping out in a very new way. You know, for most of my professional life, Korea was the country that had to buy things from others to protect itself. And you're now seeing a big transition. We're seeing a transition where Korea is now producing things for itself and potentially producing things to sell to us. This is unprecedented. And it's really a remarkable development. There are only five or six countries in the world that can produce a high-performance aircraft, for example. It's remarkable Korea has been able to do this. And I, as you know, they're uh, in the competition for a new trainer aircraft that we want to buy in the United States. And it's, a, it's the part of the reason we wanted to have this conference was to say, if we're going to be, we've been military partners, now for 50 years, 
now 70 years, but we now are potentially going to be business partners in a very new way. And that means we need to understand more of how you do business and how you think about problems. And you need to spend some time thinking about this complex acquisition system we have over here. You know, because if we're going to partner, it's going to take a lot, of, a lot more familiarity with each other in this dimension of our relationship. So this is going to be a very important conference, and we look forward to having a very fruitful discussion with all of you today. Uh, is there anything you guys want to say before I introduce Minister Chan? Well, let, then let me just turn to say we're, we're delighted to have Minister Chan with us. He's the first Minister of Defense Acquisition uh, and heads up the Defense Acquisition Program. Uh, I had a chance to meet with him in his headquarters. Now, he's not new to defense technology. He's not new to defense acquisition. This is a man who is, uh, truly is a rocket scientist, you know? We, we use that as a term of art in America for really smart people that have been in the defense business a long time. He is a rocket scientist in his own good, good uh, reputational background. And but we're lucky to have him here, and he is leading this ministry at an important time. So if I might ask the minister to please join me up here, we look forward to hearing his remarks. Would you please welcome with your applause, Minister Chang Myun Jin. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Henry. Thank you uh, for your warm welcome and introduction. I would uh, like to express my deepest uh, gratitude uh, to all of you for allowing me to speak in front of uh, renowned experts in defense acquisition and for honoring uh, us uh, with your presence at uh, this uh, conference uh, co-hosted by the Center for Strategic and International Studies uh, and the Defense Acquisition Program uh, Administration. It is uh, no exaggeration to say that the world is going through a period of uh, turbulence uh, when it comes to international security environment, considering uh, regional conflicts uh, deriving from conventional factors, including territory, religion, and race, act of uh, terrorism committed by extremists, including uh, the ISIL, uh, without distinction of region or target, transnational and non-military threats, including cybersecurity threats, uh, and spread of infectious uh, disease, uncertainty in uh, global financial markets after Britain's uh, decision to leave the European Union. On top of that, we have North Korea nuclear and missile threats escalating more than ever, and the resulting changes in the Northeast uh, Asian security environment. The world is uh, facing more threats than it has ever experienced. In particular, the North Korean regime continues to escalate tension in the Korean Peninsula by engaging in physical provocations, including nuclear tests, long-range missile and submarine launch uh, ballistic missile test fires. Uh, it is also continuously uh, stepping up its rhetoric uh, by threatening the South, South Korea that it will use its uh, nuclear weapons and turn the Blue House into a sea of fire. Moreover, as the U.S. government is in the transition period, the North is demanding recognition as a legitimate uh, nuclear state while cautiously watching how the international community will determine sanctions against the regime, which includes adoption of additional United Nations uh, Security Council resolutions against its uh, fifth uh, nuclear test. It is expected uh, that the regime is likely to engage in further provocation in different forms, including nuclear and missile test whenever it deems necessary to obtain political and military advantages. The acceleration of nuclear and missile capabilities of North Korea poses a grave threat uh, to global peace and security. It also serves as a direct threat to the security of the Re Republic of Korea and the U.S. That is why the two countries are required uh, to come up with comprehensive and specific measures uh, against the regime in diplomatic and military aspects. Considering the current uh, global security environment and tension in the Korean Peninsula, the Republic of Korea and 
and U.S. have to work uh, to in close cooperation with the international community, which includes the uh, United Nations. Uh, that means uh, the incoming U.S. administration uh, determines policy towards uh, Asia-Pacific region, including rebalancing. Uh, to Asia and Pacific uh, become uh, critical uh, more so than ever before. The area which is directly exposed to North Korean threats has been engaging defense acquisition based on following acquisition priorities, established kill chain and Korean air and missile defense capabilities and argument forces to the North Korea's regional provocations and enhanced defense R&D. Today, I would like to address the progress in the field of these areas along with the need to further expand international R&D cooperation. I started my career at the Agency for the Defense Development in 1974 when I was commissioned as a second lieutenant. In 1976, I continued my mission as a researcher at the ADD to take part in the missile development program, starting from the NHK-1 program, which was also called back Rom Apecom, the first surface-to-surface -surface missile to the NHK-2 program, Hyunmu, a ballistic missile program, as I was there for decades to witness historic transformation. I believe I can describe the history of Korea's defense R&D better than anyone else in this room. It has been 40 years since the ROK has advanced into the defense industry when it launched the Yugo project, a modern nation project of the ROK armed forces. Since then, the defense industry has become the cornerstone of Korea's security and a driving engine for development in industry and economy. In the 1950s, when Korea was devastated by the Korean War, it had no choice but to rely on the military assistance provided by U.S. Nevertheless, after a series of incidents, including the Blue House raid and Pueblo incident, uh, Korean people has been prompted to realize the need for self-reliant defense. The ROK in the 1970s, which lacked in both technology and capital, uh, started production of basic weapons, including rifles, mortars, grenades, and based on technology transfer from allies like the United States. In the 1980s, the ROK, which gradually gained technological capabilities, succeeded in developing more sophisticated weapon systems, such as surface-to-surface -surface missiles, K-200 armored vehicle, and small submarines. And in 1990s, K-9 self-propelled artillery, KT-1 basic trainer jet, and K-2 main battle tank. In the new millennium, Korea has been making concerted efforts to develop the KFX, medium altitude, and unmanned aerial vehicle and surface-to-air missiles. As a result, the defense industry of the ROK is now starting to gain global competitiveness, enabling joint R&D projects with advanced nations such as the U.S. or the U.K. in the areas which the ROK has competitive advantages. There is obviously much room for improvement, of course. Based on these uh, projects, however, our uh, research of the technology level has some room for improvement. First of all, the key technology for future uh, warfare needs to be developed rapidly so that we can adapt to the changing dynamic uh, warfare situations. And we are shifting from fast follower strategy to uh, something more future oriented. We need to in enhance interoperability with our key allies, including the United States, in a way that adapts to our own circumstances in a uh, more aggressive, rather more active manner. The United States as well uh, has key advantage, but it needs to go further to strengthen its advantage down the road. And the DARPA is playing a key role as uh, far as I understand. And with the rapid development of IT and the uh, weapon system, there is open system uh, market uh, architecture is being adopted. So module-based uh, weapon system development is being actively pursued as far as I understood. The uh, technological understanding and or uh, level is different from that of the United States, but we are trying to uh, put in place a legal institution so that we can have firm ground to take off our uh, research and development. When it comes to the United States, in the past Cold War era, spin-off was the name of the game. So there was much uh, development in the private sector uh, technology. However, since the 1990s, private sector development uh, took off. So there was growing interest in spin-off. And an indication was that DARPA 
uh, is playing a key role in many spin-off programs. Korea is also taking the cue since the 1990s. Samsung, LG, and Hyundai, other uh, global-level technology companies are, are being active partners so that we can actively enhance private R&D uh, uh, technology and so that it can be linked with our defense capabilities. However, its performance has not been very satisfactory yet to overcome this uh, shortcoming. Uh, since the planning stage, we are actively uh, trying to uh, research, identify, and tap into private technology. Also, we are trying to expand and secure database and uh, promoting various events where the defense and the private sector can work together so that the private sector can be actively incorporated in the defense technology. As this top-notch uh, defense technology becomes more available, to meet the demand and to enhance the level of sophistication so that we can contribute to uh, the better interoperability between us and our key allies. And in order to meet a long-term uh, uh, defense strategy being firm and clear to our allies, we want to uh, actively uh, utilize and uh, identify uh, joint research and development opportunities. And there is a global economic recession. And since the 1990s and mid-1990s, global defense budget and its increased rate is on the steady decline. And to overcome the circumstances, many countries are uh, trying to identify opportunities for joint research and development. Joint research and development is perf uh, performed under the uh, limited defense budgets, yet with the purpose of carrying out our defense performances successfully. This is a very useful tool, and this is done in a very uh, uh, risk-sharing manner so that we can, one country can significantly reduce its own risks. So joint research and development offers an opportunity for win-win. However, because of the differences in administration and legal processes and time that is consumed and the tendency to protect their own technology, uh, it has uh, uh, faced some or roadblocks, if you will, and has been slower than we originally expected. And Korea is no exception, particularly many of the latecomers when it comes to technological development is set on securing more advanced technology uh, by uh, just uh, building relationship with more advanced nations. And the uh, technology exporters uh, try to tap into defense export markets, so they tend to be more lukewarm in reaching out to other prospective partners. So matchmaking has not been that easy. In particular, when it comes to the Asia-Pacific region, North Korea is set on developing uh, nuclear arms, and its level has been even more sophisticated. So outside the Korean Peninsula, there are many common threats, and that are becoming even greater opposing greater risks, then with greater risks, and there will be heightened interest to pursue joint risk, which was uh, per perceived as a zero sum. Now it needs to be transformed into positive sum game, particularly countries like United States that have absolute technological advantage. These advanced nations also have some areas where they need to uh, have cooperation with other partners. And despite global economic downturn, there is clear continued need for sustained uh, defense technological edge. So when we combine all these different kinds of nations, it can meet our mutual strategic and uh, security needs. Not only that, technological cooperation based on alliance will come back in the form of strengthening our reliance, uh, relationship even further. And if you can spread to other nations, I think it will go a long way toward further enhancing our global security. Iraq-U.S. alliance goes back to the time when the U.S. entered the Korean War and signed a mutual defense treaty with the Republic of Korea. By deterring North Korean threats in the aftermath of the mess of the war, the U.S. paved the groundwork for Korea to build its defense capabilities and achieve economic growth in a short period of time. At the same time, the two countries expanded political, cultural, and social exchanges to forge a concrete alliance which shares the value of democracy, market economy, and human rights. The U.S., which is known to be the most advanced country in technology, is capable of engaging in research and development cooperation with almost any country in the world. When choosing partner for research and development cooperations, countries tend to consider such criteria as technology level, 
uh, economic feasibility and geopolitical importance. Uh, nevertheless, one must remember that the value sharing is the most important factor when forming a partnership. I would like to highlight that other than advanced technologies owned uh, by the top uh, Korean companies in the field of hardware, information technology, mobile phone, semiconductor, and shipbuilding, along with the, 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 its 10th largest economy in the world, as well as its geopolitical importance. The Republic of Korea is one of the few countries that share the values that the U.S. Uh, adv adv advocates. Dr. Kendall, the Undersecretary of Acquisition Technology and Logistics, and I, as co-chairs for the Rock U.S. Defense Technological Cooperation Committee, have shared the need for expansion in international research and development cooperation, and also identified robotics and autonomy as the area for joint technology planning in this year's uh, meeting. I look forward to seeing uh, much uh, tangible progress in research and de uh, development cooperation between Iraq and the U.S. and to be the talk of the town as best practices of international research and development cooperation and hope uh, today's conference will be a meaningful venue uh, to provide insights on the way forward uh, for the joint research and uh, development efforts. The uh, T-50 program was initially in, uh, started uh, with the support of the U.S. Uh, government and was modified into to TA-50, a tactical trainer. It went even further uh, to develop FA-50, a light attack a variant, a variant which now plays a pivotal role in defending Iraq's uh, airspace. And now uh, the ROC uh, wishes to contribute uh, to the advanced pilot training program of the United States if given the opportunity. By doing so, it will help the U.S. in reinforcing its capabilities while enhancing security of both countries at the same time. The bilateral cooperation led by the defense industry is a very encouraging phenomenon, and I look forward to seeing lively discussions at uh, the uh, defense industrial cooperation uh, session. Along with ROC U.S. bilateral cooperation, we are also accelerating our discussions uh, to form a multilateral technology consultation uh, consultative group involving countries in the Asia Pacific region, including the ROC and the U.S. The discussion on creating uh, the group uh, was initiated based on the common understanding that North Korea poses threat not only to the Korean Peninsula but also to the sovereign territory of the countries in the region. It is my hope uh, that the series of uh, these uh, uh, small steps uh, toward realizing research and development uh, cooperation will become a giant step for the alliance uh, to be further solidified and expanded uh, to other countries, uh, which will eventually uh, contribute uh, to realizing peace in the global uh, community. Uh, of late, uh, there has been uh, quite a bit of talk uh, in Korea and also uh, the U.S. Uh, and there had been some uh, concerns. Uh, the U.S. President-elect uh, Donald Trump, however, reaffirmed uh, South Korean President uh, Park Geun-hye uh, during a phone call that he he is committed uh, to further developing their alliance, uh, responding jointly to North Korea uh, and imposing stronger sanctions against the reclusive regime. Uh, that means even after new administrations take office, uh, Rock uh, U.S. Alliance will continue to serve as a linchpin to peace and security in Asia. Thank you for your attention today. I am confident that today's conference will become an opportunity to set the big picture for defense, uh, research and development policy, and international cooperation of the two countries. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Chang. My name, good morning, everyone. My name is Victor Chai. I'm the Senior Advisor and Korea Chair here at CSIS. And um, on behalf of uh, the Korea Chair and the International Security Program and my colleague, um, Dr. Kathleen Hicks, uh, we want to welcome you all here this morning and thank um, the Minister for his comments. Um, uh, I want to just take a moment to uh, thank all of the partners who've worked with us on this project. Uh, obviously, CSIS, the Korea Chair and International Security Program, but the Defense Acquisition Program um, Administration, uh, the Defense Acquisition for Technology and Quality, as well as Korea Aerospace Industries for partnering with us uh, in this uh, conference today. Um, uh, so the Minister has uh, uh, agreed to take a couple of questions. We have a little bit of time. 
given on the very rich presentation, given the very rich presentation he's just given us this morning. Um, so um, I will open the floor. Uh, please um, try to make your question a question. Uh, and uh, please identify yourself for the benefit of uh, the minister. We have, we're fixing a technical problem here, so. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is the first time to get Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, all right. Uh, Andrew Hunter. Hi, I'm Andrew Hunter. I am director of the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group here at CSIS. Uh, uh, Minister, I uh, took great note of your comment about uh, the possibility of uh, cooperative efforts on robotics and autonomy as an area of discussion that you have coming up soon with your colleagues. I wonder if you could uh, tell us a little more about how you see those technologies uh, playing into the uh, efforts of the Korean Armed Forces to defend Korea. Um, and also, if you have the opportunity, a little bit about um, uh, the capabilities that you see in Korean industry in those areas. I'm sorry, we're not getting any feed. We have seen much improvement, uh, rather remarkable, I would say, especially when it comes to robotics and uh, when it comes to robotic uh, control uh, technologies, I think we have made uh, quite a bit of uh, improvements. And so the private and as well as the government are uh, making heavy investments into these areas. And as to the robotics, uh, we continue to focus on developing these technologies. There are microelectronics uh, technologies uh, which uh, are uh, important part of the robotics. Uh, we have been focusing on that as well. There's a hubo uh, that's been uh, developed by, by KAIST, and uh, this is for responding to emergencies and uh, catastrophes uh, throughout the world. I think uh, it's uh, done uh, rather well. Uh, and autonomous controlling uh, area uh, when it comes to controls i think uh, we've made uh, good progress and uh, we continue to focus on that as well of course uh, compared to the uh, u.s technology uh, we may not be at par yet uh, however uh, we are making uh, good uh, progress and we continue to forge ahead in this uh, in these areas and when it comes to robotics and autonomy i don't know when, when we consider uh, the geography and geopolitical uh, situation uh, for korea uh, as you know, Korea is a peninsula uh, surrounded by water in uh, three si on three sides. And uh, North Korea has uh, demonstrated uh, that they have SLVM uh, technologies. And also, we know that there are certain uh, submarine bases uh, on the eastern part of North Korean uh, shores. And as such, it's important for us to find ways to respond uh, to such uh, threats and we believe the robotics actually uh, could uh, come to 
aid uh, when it comes to our enhanced uh, defense capabilities uh, towards uh, North Korean threats, including SLBM threats uh, by North Korea. And also, there are some unmanned uh, submarine uh, threats, uh, which we feel uh, that's been uh, becoming more uh, strengthened on the North Korean side. And as such, uh, it's uh, become uh, more important for us to be technologically uh, advanced uh, in these areas. I, I'm not sure if I responded fully to your questions, but uh, that's where we are headed. Hey, thank you. Uh, next question. <coughs> yes, uh, General Sharp. Minister Grace. Hi, yeah. <laughs> Great to see you. Um, I read it this morning in the Korean, one of the Korean newspapers that you and the, the, uh, the Secretary of Commerce here are working together to sign some sort of agreement on information sharing uh, to share between our industries, between the United States on information about our weapon systems and your weapon systems. I think that's a great initiative. Any comments on that? And I think on a larger question, just how would you recommend and what are your recommendations to our government here as to how to do that, to be able to share information so that we can more effectively, we can jointly develop the capabilities that are needed by both of our militaries in the future? Thank you. In uh, the, uh, the governments, uh, with the uh, Commerce Department in the U.S., we have uh, inked a deal uh, to share information. In 2014, uh, we had uh, been focusing on uh, the under the table activities uh, when it comes to Korea and uh, defense industry. And there had been uh, quite a, a, a you know, issue uh, relating to the corruption of the industry. And part of uh, that uh, came uh, from sonar uh, sensors uh, when we were purchasing uh, sonar equipment from U.S. company, uh, it uh, later uh, turned out uh, that uh, the company that was chosen in the U.S. Uh, could not actually provide uh, the items uh, which were to be supplied to the Korea uh, government. And that was an example of the corruption uh, that was identified uh, through our uh, internal inspections and audits. And uh, it turned out uh, it was a paper company uh, in uh, the U.S. And uh, our government had uh, somehow approved a purchase uh, from uh, the company. And uh, our government uh, was not able to, uh, in advance, uh, identify such uh, fraudulent activity. And not limited to that, uh, there were other uh, contracts uh, that our government had made with uh, U.S. Uh, companies uh, in which we later found that there were uh, quality problems, uh, that uh, qualities were lacking and that uh, they were not uh, properly controlled. So these were some of the uh, problems that we were trying to address uh, through our uh, mutual uh, cooperation. And uh, there are many uh, companies uh, and corporations within the defense industry in the U.S. And part of the problem that we had in Korea was that we were unable to verify all these companies uh, uh, which were in the U.S. And as such, it was necessary for us to share more information between the governments so that we had better understanding as to the entities and the other uh, constituents of uh, the U.S. Uh, defense industry. And uh, this would allow for the Korean government to verify uh, the uh, 
true presence and uh, constituency of the uh, U.S. companies. And the same goes for the Korean companies as well, uh, as uh, Korean companies uh, trying to make more headways into the U.S. market. Uh, this uh, would allow for more better uh, verification of these uh, corporations uh, existing in Korea uh, who will be uh, exporting into the uh, U.S. Uh, industries and U.S. market. And this would be a good opportunity for both countries in this regard. I responded to your first question, uh, General Sharp, but I didn't actually uh, get a chance to prepare for the second question. Actually, General Sharp, if you wouldn't mind uh, asking me the second uh, part again. From your experience, what is your government and what would recommendations you making to our government of how U.S. industry and Korean industries can better work together to develop the technologies we need for our for our future militaries. Yes, thank you. As I mentioned in my speech, in actuality, when I was working at the Korea DARPA program, or ADD that is, between our two governments, there was joint uh, research and development project between our two nations at a certain level. However, up until 10 years ago or so, because of the huge gap between our two nations, which was really, really big, technological cooperation between our two nations was very limited and there was much reservation and negative view on the U.S. side. So some projects uh, carried out to, were carried out to a certain degree but uh, were halted at a mid-phase. There were numerous or several examples as to that. However, looking ahead, Korea's te technological development goals are different in that we are trying to move away from the past where just we went through the motion. We want to be more future oriented where we can be uh, properly adapted to the future warfare situation so that we can uh, introduce uh, 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 advanced technological development that the U.S. has uh, already secured and we need to develop that more actively and along the way we need to really join hands and perform joint research and development projects. And our internal assessment really has given us an assurance that we have reached that level where we can perform that next stage development with the United States. So along the way, I believe that the United States as it uh, reviews alliance relationship with the ROK and to further develop it, I would appreciate it if the U.S. can be more willing to work together with Korea, especially with uh, the areas of technology that could be beneficial for the United States, and it will be really beneficial because it will first uh, contribute to strengthen the uh, relationship and become a good model for strengthening security in the international community as well. I hope that answers your question, General. Um, if I could ask you a question, and it sort of follows yeah. from General Sharp's question. Um, the, um, <clears throat> as you've noticed, we have a, a new president coming into office here in Washington. Um, and his views on Korea and the Korean alliance are not yet well known. Uh, but the rhetoric during the campaign suggests um, that uh, President-elect Trump wants allies uh, to carry a larger burden. Um, and I guess the question is, if that's the case, and we don't know yet, but if, if uh, the Trump administration is interested in sort of changing the nature of the U.S. ROK alliance, how does that affect the way you think about defense cooperation? Um, and what would be the argument that you would make about why um, 
U.S. ROK defense cooperation is so important to U.S. interests and U.S. Uh, defense strategy? It's a very uh, politically sensitive question. I find myself in a hard place to answer that. However, my basic thought about that is just this. If, and this may be a big if, the President-elect Trump and his administration, when it comes to alliance with ROK, of course, the campaign's rhetoric has been toward that direction. And if, if there is a huge demand for more burden on the part of the ROK, I think Korea will inevitably have to embrace that. And if that happens, based on inter-Korean relationship, weapon system will have to be more sophisticated. And as you know very well, North Korea is in a place where it's trying uh, to base its security on the fact that it has nuclear arms. And the, the rhetoric of North Korea has been that way as it made its uh, um, hawkish announcement to the international community. And there is a growing threat that they will indeed tap into their nuclear arsenal to pose a threat to the South. However, when you look at South Korea, as you know very well, we have committed ourselves to no nuclearization and possessing no nuclear arms. And most of the Korean population are clearly aware of the threat posed by having nuclear arms or of any nuclear arms. If South Korea, however, reaches a level we can uh, capably uh, have uh, nuclear arms or develop arms, it will be a different matter. But we are at a stage to just cope with the North Korea nuclear arms. Kill chain KMPN have been the main ways to deal with it and cope with it. It is a preemptive uh, measure that we have largely focused on so far, which has involved a large budget. And as you know very well, next year's budget is about is about 400 trillion won, or 400 billion US dollars. And it's about 40 billion US dollars for defense. And when it comes to the defense capability strengthening, out of that amount, that will be geared towards enhancing weapon system. It will be about 12 billion US dollars that has been secured for our next year budget. The current weapon system that we already have in place will have to be maintained continuously. And on top of that, whatever that is lacking on our current weapon system will have to be complemented and enhanced. And whatever has been aging will have to be replaced and substituted for. That really uh, constitutes the bulk of our budget. And welfare budget has been on the steady increase, which has had some uh, restricting impact on our defense budget. And on the same page, the, the threat that was posed by North Korea has been increasing. So that really puts us in much dilemma. Therefore, to have a lot of defense budget secured will be all good. However, it will mean that we'll have to cut back on other budgets, which will inevitably invite a lot of resistance. And if that ever happens, the ROK government will place ourselves in a dilemma, but our focus and priority will have to be on putting first priority on defense, in my personal view. When it comes to ROK-US defense alliance, and how can it genuinely contribute to US defense interest? The key basis, the question was along the line, this is my personal view. If you look at the Korean Peninsula and its map, just envision it just for a brief moment, then the answer will become much clearer. The Korean Peninsula uh, is not big a country. On the left, there is China. And on top, there is China as well. And on our right, there is Russia. 
And right above us, there is North Korea, of course. And below South Korea, Japan kind of surrounds us and is bordering with uh, uh, the Philippines and Indonesia. And South China Sea is being surrounded by these nations. And at the middle, South Korea happens to be located, uh, geopolitically speaking. Based on the geopolitical uh, circumstances, as I stated earlier, the Republic of Korea, in terms of our relationship with the United States, uh, we are in a place where we are very keen on securing uh, security and defense when it comes to the West Pacific. And I believe from the U.S. interest point of view, the South Korea can play a key role in securing your uh, defense interest on the West Pacific side. So if I can have any chance to give a proposal to the U.S. policymakers, the geopolitical location of South Korea, vis-a-vis -vis South, or rather China and Russia and the Pacific uh, uh, in response to possible a growing influence of China and Russia, I think we play a key geopolitical role in stopping that, and also from Bloody Bostok and other submarine uh, threats and activities uh, uh, done by submarines. I guess uh, South Korea play a key strategic location where we can properly supervise and monitor all those submarine activities. Even uh, given that, I think we uh, offer some key uh, strategic and geopolitical values to the U.S. defense interest. And I hope I answer your question, Dr. Cha. That's my personal view. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we'll go in the back first, right in the back. Yes, that lady there. Thank you. Hi, Lee Jung Greco, Flight Global. Um, I had a question regarding KFX. Um, my understanding is that the U.S. denied the export license for the radar, um, as well as IR search and track and jammers. Um, you talked about improving the relations um, with Korea and the U.S. defense industry, um, but our uh, U.S. Air Force um, uh, Heidi Grant was just talking about this the other day, getting to yes with other countries. Um, is Korea still looking to get to yes as far as those uh, export licenses go for KFX for some of those other technologies, or is that a done deal at this point? Hmm. Let me respond to your question. ASUS, the radar export, you're press referring to uh, is a radar. As uh, stated before, when it comes to Korea, F4 and F5 uh, are, are in need of uh, replacement. So we are uh, trying to implement uh, KFX. Uh, we have uh, made uh, heavy uh, investment uh, in that uh, regard, uh, especially uh, true for last year. And there are certain technologies needed uh, to implement that. F-35A, we were, we are in the process of getting uh, that uh, from the U.S. government uh, through FMS offset program. However, in reality, the technologies that uh, we wanted, uh, the radar that could be integrated uh, with the air carriers, uh, that's what we really wanted. As is as a radar uh, and other uh, technologies uh, were uh, very much uh, wanted uh, by the Korean government. Uh, so that's the request we had made, of course. And in reality, the U.S., uh, when it comes to technology transfer of such, uh, we have received a notice, a uh, decision uh, that uh, it would be denied. And as such, uh, this, uh, these are the technologies we cannot get from other sources, and uh, that uh, puts us in a very uh, tough uh, spot uh, because the research centers 
uh, in Korea are unable to proceed any further uh, without uh, these very uh, needed uh, essential uh, technologies. These are uh, technologies would, which would be essential for the success of our uh, latest uh, program, uh, given that uh, we are uh, focusing uh, all our uh, efforts and abilities uh, to acquire uh, these uh, technologies. Uh, but as uh, stated before, uh, these technologies are not something uh, that we can source from other sources. Uh, and uh, this is something that we have been focusing on uh, for the past uh, decade or so. Uh, however, uh, we have made uh, satisfactory uh, progress. And as such, uh, the government is uh, pushing for these uh, continuously, even at this moment. And when it comes to KFX, when it comes to the research and development for such, there are additional technologies. Uh, we are waiting, awaiting approval from the U.S. government. And uh, we are pushing uh, for these to be approved. Uh, and as such, uh, the participants in this uh, conference, uh, we look forward to uh, your uh, uh, continued uh, support. And also, thank you uh, in certain regards uh, where we had uh, gotten the approvals. I, uh, I hope that was uh, enough of an answer to your question. Very much. The technology that you're still waiting on right now, are those the same radars and jammers that I spoke about for KFX, or are those additional separate technologies? If you can speak to those specifically, what those are at all. Yes, these four technologies, when it comes to that, the U.S. provided well, actually no approval, so it got turned down basically. So as I stated earlier, Korea is uh, has uh, decided to continue on with our domestic policy, rather domestic development, and on top of that, regarding a question is there any other technology needed for KFX? We will continue to place a request to the U.S. government uh, in the context of the offset programs. Questions from the floor, but I'm afraid that we've run out of time. Um, I want to thank the minister for taking the time this morning um, um, to be with us and also to answer a, a lot of questions. We really appreciate it. Um, we will um, now move to our next panel, um, which is about uh, defense R&D cooperation. Uh, my colleague Andrew Hunter will introduce uh, that next panel, but please, before we uh, transition, uh, let's thank the minister for his remarks this morning.
Well, thank you, Victor. Uh, I just want to give a, a brief word of introduction for our moderator for this panel. Uh, we have uh, enlisted um, someone who has long experience in cooperative research and development. He, he asked me not to call him an expert, so I won't, even though he is. Uh, uh, Mr. David Ahern, a career naval officer uh, who uh, was an acquisition professional, engaged actually, uh, and led a uh, cooperative R&D effort uh, under those terms after he completed his military service, uh, continued to serve the nation in a civilian capacity, including uh, when I had the good fortune to have him as a colleague within the Office of Secretary of Defense uh, for Acquisition Technology and Logistics, where he served as the uh, uh, director of, uh, well, actually, the, the job title changed a couple of times, as happens in government when, you're, when they're there for a while, but uh, director of uh, tactical warfare systems. Uh, and during the time that uh, Dave led the office, uh, they also had uh, significant uh, oversight of strategic systems as well. Uh, and he will lead our panel this morning with an excellent crew of panelists on defense research uh, and development cooperation. So thank you, David, and, and welcome. Yeah, thank, thank you, Andrew, and I am delighted to be here. <clears throat> I certainly appreciate uh, the minister's remarks today. I think I'm not accustomed to doing this, uh, so I will have to uh, I'll go back and forth with the, uh, with the microphone. I'd like to introduce the panel first. Uh, to my right is uh, Mr. Shan Su Kim, who is a technology director uh, leading the planning team, principal research at the Defense Agency for Technology and Quality. They are responsible for defense technology planning um, and information. Uh, Mr. Uh, Shansu Kim has an extensive uh, background from the biography that I have in research and development, both at that agency and as a research, uh, research in, in, uh, in the Republic of Korea before he joined that agency. He's also uh, been a participant in a cooperative uh, program, uh, science and engineering, uh, spending a year at the uh, Navy Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. So I look forward to, to you. And next to him is uh, uh, Dr. Ildong Kim, who is, of course, the uh, Director General of, uh, of DAPA, and we've heard the minister uh, refer to DAPA this morning. I would also mention that in the biography, it, it does refer to the fact that Dr. Ildong Kim uh, was involved in the development and the production of the uh, TF-50, if I read that correctly, sir. Then uh, to his right uh, is uh, Dale, uh, San Dale uh, Orman, who is from the uh, Defense Department the Assistant Secretary of Defense from the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Research and Development. He is director of the research element of it, uh, which is involved in uh, planning and, and, uh, and execution of research. And prior to his assignment or his uh, becoming the principal deputy in the uh, R&D, Assistant Secretary of Defense for R&D, um, Mr. Orman was the uh, director, or no, well, yes, was the director of the uh, Army's Research, Development, and Engineering Command. And to his right is Mr. Greg Sanders, who uh, works for Andrew Hunter, as I understand it here at CSIS, and, uh, and is involved in, of course, the uh, Defense Industrial Initiative Group, uh, where he uh, focuses on the analysis of budgets and spending, uh, not only for the United States, but across the world. So I do think that we have a, a good and knowledgeable panel I'll start with the uh, with questions really general to, to give the panel members an opportunity to uh, talk about defense uh, research and development cooperation, their background, their expectations, their involvement in uh, cooperative, cooperative R&D programs. I think it would be appropriate then to just go down the line. Uh, Mr. Sean Soo Kim, if you are ready to speak, I invite you to uh, take the floor. Thank you for a nice comment. Uh, thank you so much for this privilege. I thank it as a personal honor that I got this opportunity to speak at this panel. Is probably because I, working at ADD, 
uh, for about 16 years as a researcher before then, as DAPA was created in 2006, I uh, was put in charge of uh, technology planning. So as I was involved in technology planning, how can we really design and perform joint research and development? Maybe that's why I was honorably invited to speak in this morning. And the key points that I will address are not only confined to the United States, but even multilateral joint research and why they are so lacking. I want to address that. Also, my personal view why how we really can tackle the shortcoming, particularly through our cooperation with the United States. I want to really proceed in that order. First of all, as Minister Chang mentioned in his keynote speech, Korea lacks a key base for uh, top-notch technology. So from the U.S. standpoint, may, we may not seem that attractive because of that notion that has been lacking of a key technological joint uh, research, despite our strong alliance, in comparison with NATO members in particular, our cooperation has been quite lacking when it comes to its records. That's my personal view. However, during the past 10 years after the 1980s, we have expanded our R&D budget continuously. Of course, much of this R&D budget had to be uh, spent on more contingent or weapon system development, while 40% is spent on technology, core technology when it comes to the United States. We were more geared towards the, the end stage where we really make weapons. And secondly, when I took a look at 2016 budget, U.S. spends more 40, per, 40 times more than the Korea spends. So there is a different uh, uh, scales of economy that the U.S. has an advantage in over ROK. So in this context, how can Korea continue to improve our budget? I am a positive because we have potential to improve our research capability. So given that I think there is much room uh, to create win-win situation where we can benefit from each other. As Minister Chang mentioned, we have a specialty in IT and shipbuilding and cyber. So if we really uh, tap into these activities, I think it will be mutually beneficial. So I just review thumb through some case studies. There were some successful cases. Uh, raw gear, low cost eye imaging rocket was one of the success cases. We used uh, 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 ultra red uh, uh, technology by US, and it was not uh, single handedly pursued by Korea, but we successfully reduced the research period into two years and we overcame much risks. It was indeed very successful. So, robotics and autonomous, I think, are the areas where there's much ample opportunity to reduce risks and perform joint risks and reduce our budget cost. I think it will offer us a good opportunity as a good model. And the second area, it's not confined to our two countries in any multilateral uh, settings, pattern war, if you will, when it comes to technology transfer and how to protect technology. It's uh, actually a dilemma. Whenever there is joint research, there has to be, there's bound to be some technology transfer. However, when there is a, a, a need to protect our own security, that becomes a priority in many circumstances, how should we really protect our strategic key assets and really pursue this joint research can pose a dilemma. However, even in that area, when it comes to that area, we really improve the law and we really have a ample legal system to, to press for, brace for that uh, new stage. So as long as there is a policy will between our two governments, I think we can go ahead and perform that, particularly not only North Korea, nuclear threats, but cyber and submarine threats. So we are surrounded by these threats, multiple threats, and it really behooves well for our joint efforts. All these Asia Pacific nations uh, are facing same or similar problems. So as we really emphasize the key importance of North East Asia security, which is in line with the best interest of the U.S. security and with the growing influence of China, 
I think there is a much rationale for our cooperation. Relatively speaking, we have this relative advantage in such areas, so we really set our goals and concept in that area and reduce the development period and cut back on the budget, and we really can use Korea as a core marketing target, and this will benefit us mutually, but this will contribute to enhancing security in uh, Northeast Asia as well. The second point is this. This is my personal proposal. How can we indeed end up overcoming this hurdle and perform a joint research? SCM's a security consultative meeting within that framework, there is a practical working level meeting. We have, um, you know, uh, DTICC and TCSC as well. This is Technology Cooperation Subcommittee underneath DTICC, that is. And in that framework, there is certain discussion that is made for joint research between our two nations. It meets around <coughs> once a year, and we share opinion, And but there is only so much it can do based on the, the, the track record. It has been confined to basic technology when it comes to our discussion that took place in the framework of TS, TCSC to create synergies Indeed, the key thing will be to target the key targets, the key priorities, and incubate them. And from the very onset, we really got to actively engage in um, mutual cooperation. I think we got to really go on top of TCSC, so just tentatively put joint armed service. Uh, planning committee, we really can really design that and work on that together. And by that future-oriented framework, we can identify key projects and come up with the concept of operability and make it more concrete. And we can really proceed to the stage of budgeting and whatnot so that we can go more long-term. As Minister Cheng mentioned, uh, robotics and autonomous are the areas where we already agree to perform joint research, but we should go further. We can go further and at least in the stage of planning so we can really draw a roadmap in that uh, tentative committee. Recently, uh, there is a Ministry of Commerce and DOD in Korea, rather in America, there was successful cooperation, especially to developing rescue robots, and each government will set aside $3 million for the next three years. I think it will be a good case for our benchmarking. If this uh, committee that I just proposed personally can be a good model to follow that successful route. And based on my experience, I want to make another proposal. In the mutual exchange of human resources is the next point. Because human resources is the best area where we can strengthen our cooperation. When it comes to TCSC, people gather. But there is only so much this committee can accomplish. But the agencies that have a stake in that committee, if they can share human resources, I think that will be very good. We have engineering science SH program already in place. Back in 2014, for about one year, I worked in MPSC regarding joint research. I had mutual visits with my US colleagues. I had a, a lot of uh, identified a lot of opportunities for joint research. I came back to Korea and I incorporated them in our mid and long term uh, plans. Likewise, if we can really enhance uh, exchange of human resources and if agencies that really put their own resources and join hands and enhance uh, mutual exchange of human resources, I think it would be extremely beneficial. And there was a nuclear test and the missile test, unprecedented uh, level of threat, and the tension is very, very high in and across the Korean Peninsula, whether it is the sanction or six-party talks or China's uh, uh, you know, disinterested view, and that has not been very helpful given all these circumstances. How can we really peacefully resolve North Korea nuclear threat? Uh, I think it's not going to be easy anytime soon. However, in this circumstance, a strong alliance between Korea and the United States will continue to play a key role, pivotal role, in solving that problem. Thank you. It was a, uh, quite a significant uh, a number of ideas uh, an overview and a uh, number of uh, of ideas for us to talk about 
I, I think now, um, if it's agreeable, I would ask you, Mr. Orman, uh, to make, to not, 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 I mean, what I'm looking for is the same as Mr. Uh, Shansu Kim gave, an overview of cooperative research and development from your perspective in, in uh, the Department of Defense. Um, and, and in your involvement specifically in, in that arena. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And I very much appreciate the invitation to come and speak today and talk about what uh, we certainly view as, uh, as a growing relationship in science and technology collaboration. Um, clearly, uh, we view the uh, Republic of Korea as a critical partner. And there's been a number of efforts that we've taken in the last year or two to help strengthen that. It's recognized that, uh, especially in the field of robotics, the work done by the Republic of Korea, especially with respect to uh, their performance at the Risa DARPA uh, Robotics Challenge is really quite impressive. Uh, and so therefore, you had three teams that competed. They did extraordinarily well, obviously. Uh, a lot of this focused on uh, disaster and emergency relief responses. So continuing to do work and conducting humanitarian assistance and disaster recovery uh, provide very critical, provide areas where we can do things that allow us to transfer technology and have real collaboration in what we would consider to be a sort of a non-threat environment, which makes it very easy to set up the collaboration. The U.S. Uh, Department of Defense and the Ministry of Trade, Industry, and Energy of the Republic of Korea are leading contributors to the successful conduct of humanitarian resistance and disaster relief. Um, in particular, uh, the ROCs, uh, the Republic of Korea's MOTI supporting a significant component of the Republic of Korea government expertise in robotics and enabling technologies. Uh, we've had, we've recently, through Dr. Staffan's office in, uh, of the Secretary of Defense, where we do basic research, has put $3 million towards supporting joint U.S. Korea, North uh, Republic of Korea and researchers to do joint projects. There was recently a ceremony in the Republic of Korea that was attended by the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, Mr. Steve Welby, to kick off these research projects. It was at the end of a few, couple of day conference on robotics. Um, as you know, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Um, um, Mr. Welby went over there and spent a couple of days, also traveled down to visit ADD and see what they were doing in some of their works. I mean, uh, Mr. Kendall has been to the Republic of Korea to help foster uh, increased collaboration s and And so there is uh, a lot of priority on our part to do this uh, because we really want to do things that enable us to get the benefit out of both. So where we have scientists and engineers who can work together and there can be a mutual exchange of ideas and an opportunity to collaborate on solve joint problems, uh, there's tremendous opportunity. Uh, a, when we were, when Mr. Welby was over there, He's, ADD talked to him about six potential projects. Mr. Welby said if you could come back with some additional specifics so we could really describe exactly what kind of work you would like to do so we can find the right researchers to set up those types of collaborative efforts, we will work towards doing that. Um, the Tank and Automotive Research and Engineering Command up in Warren, Michigan, uh, works for the Army. They have uh, information exchange agreement that was recently signed and they are looking at potential projects as well. So I think there's tremendous opportunity to take advantage of the real expertise that the Republic of Korea has in its science and engineering uh, to work with our researchers. So it's all a matter of finding the right projects, defining those terms, working through, as was described earlier, the bureaucracy of the paperwork we have to go through, which is you know, the normal state of things. Uh, but there's a lot of motivation on our part to take advantage of what you have to offer and help build a stronger relationship. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Ildong Kim, I thought I would ask you then to, uh, to speak next, again, an overview of introducing what you've been doing uh, your thoughts on uh, defense cooperative research and development, of course, and where you see where you see opportunities going forward. This is what I have prepared for today. So I'll uh, base my uh, comments on these uh, slides. When it comes to international cooperation, 
uh, especially when we deal with uh, securities uh, and also economics and uh, technology fronts. In particular, when it comes to securities, I believe it's important uh, that we realize the common threats uh, that are faced uh, by both uh, countries. Uh, the threats uh, posed by North Korea, I don't believe, is limited uh, to the Korean Peninsula. I believe it is a threat uh, that is posed to the global community. In Korea, we have close to 30,000 uh, U.S. Uh, military personnel uh, stationed. Uh, and as such, it's important uh, that U.S. Korea uh, come together and uh, be able to uh, develop uh, weapon systems uh, that can be jointly uh, utilized. And that's an important part uh, looking to the future. And also, when we talk about the money, uh, I think it's important uh, to realize uh, that the global economy is not doing all that well, uh, but uh, nevertheless, the security requirements and the budget requirements uh, in the defense area uh, continues uh, to grow. And as such, it's important uh, that uh, we come together and to allocate the limited uh, resources that we have uh, together uh, and focus in areas uh, that we can jointly uh, develop. As to technology, uh, it is uh, a given uh, that uh, there is a superi superiority uh, when it comes to technology uh, that the U.S. has in uh, most areas. However, when it comes to IT and robotics, uh, Korea does quite well as well. And when we consider that there are certain areas where Korea is doing well, I believe we can come together. And as such, uh, there should be joint uh, development, uh, research and development uh, efforts uh, taken, in particular between the Korea and the U.S. When it comes to Korea and the U.S. and also the Asia-Pacific uh, countries, uh, perhaps we could have an international uh, forum as well. So uh, bilateral as well as multilateral cooperation is uh, needed. And when it comes to bilateral cooperation, uh, there has been some uh, success uh, that we have had. Uh, however, the success that we have uh, seen have been uh, mostly about applications, uh, not, uh, and, and that's where the focus had been so far, uh, that uh, we would uh, focus uh, on uh, applications and not the fundamentals as much. Uh, uh, and I hope uh, not just the applications uh, that we would be able to also focus on fundamentals and the basic uh, technologies uh, that we uh, have. In the past, when uh, T50 was uh, being uh, developed, uh, we had Lockheed Martin uh, and the Korea coming uh, KAI uh, and developing them together. And also, there were fighter jets uh, where eight uh, countries came together and developed them together. And uh, as to bilateral cooperation, we have had some track record uh, between the two countries. And uh, however, uh, when we consider the amount of money involved, uh, where multi-billion uh, uh, dollars uh, were exchanged, uh, uh, but the uh, actual uh, joint cooperation of research and development uh, was, uh, in relative terms, uh, minuscule uh, and only involving millions of dollars. Uh, and when we can agree uh, that the threat posed by North Korea is uh, a global threat, and as such, uh, I think it's important uh, that uh, we realize the importance of uh, joint uh, strategies in dealing with North Korean threats. And, and that's why we need multilateral cooperation, uh, including Japan, uh, Singapore, as well as the uh, US and Korea. And in September of last year, uh, we had a chance to discuss this uh, in Washington, DC, uh, when we visited uh, here. And also in uh, 2017, the PACOM uh, conference, 
I hope uh, we will have uh, some uh, feasible uh, outcome uh, from uh, these uh, suggestions. Uh, there are certain advantages to be derived from multilateral cooperations. And as to Korea-U.S. relation, I believe we have shared something very special uh, for the past uh, half a century or more. And I believe uh, U.S. is well aware of the very pe peculiar uh, situation that uh, South Korea is in. And I believe uh, there is an opportunity uh, that, that we may jointly uh, come together and uh, have uh, more uh, cooperation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Doctor. Um, again, uh, there's a lot to, lot to the discussion. There's no question about there. It's significant about the discussion. Then I'd, I'd. Uh, Ask Greg uh, Sanders, as I introduced earlier, uh, who works at, who is at CSIS. Uh, again, um, same basic idea, uh, Greg, in terms of your experience, uh, your uh, work in, or your your uh, knowledge of the uh, defense R and D cooperative uh, landscape. Uh, and I will turn the microphone to you. So CSIS has recently completed a um, research study into international joint development. We looked at multiple case studies, bilateral, multilateral, and in general, defense acquisition is hard and international joint development is harder, but it still provides a variety of key benefits. So we we're looking at some larger lessons learned and I've actually had the chance to go to Korea and speak on some of these matters, but we're in a slightly different environment now than even several months ago. But many of the fundamentals um, still remain. And in other areas, we'll have to think about how joint development best fits our current context. Um, so there are four main principles that we took out of our report. Um, that when international joint development arises, and this is probably true of cooperative R&D, but I think the larger nature of joint development makes it even more important. You have to look at political, operational, and economic considerations. And whatever project is should probably be showing benefits in all of those areas, rather than just having a very large benefit in just one. Um, second, one of the things we found was component compartmentalization. So, uh, for example, perhaps in a project, Korea might take on a robotics portion of a larger project where um, ROK could largely run that project you know, on their own in cooperation and be incorporated into a larger system. Um, and when you have a level of separation like that, it can be easier for all the partners uh, to conduct their own research uh, and avoid some of the complexity that comes from um, international joint development while still gaining some of the benefits of cooperation. Um, there's a variety of various techniques um, that I think are a little in the weeds for this discussion if it can be used to mitigate the um, difficulties of international joint development and look for our for outcoming report soon on that. Um, but one of the other key things, and I think this has already been spoken to by some of our panelists and the minister, is that international joint development is also not just a way of achieving you know, economies of scale, saving money in constrained environments, but it's also a step towards future cooperation. You know, it's often best not to go for you know, the moonshot project at first, but to go for you know, the kind of areas that we've been hearing about, shipbuilding, joint development, electron, sorry, shipbuilding, robotics, electronics, uh, where there's already firm basis for cooperation, and then you can use what you get there, you know, further enhance our technology sharing, our trust, um, and then build on that towards the future. Um, that gets to the main points from our research. I think the only other thing I note is that, as we'll be hearing from um, some later panels today, the defense technology security aspect is also very key for the United States. And I think Korea's recent progress in 
the new law and will work to implement that will also probably be a firm foundation. Um, and hopefully the cooperative R&D efforts can also demonstrate the strength and improvement there. I think those are probably the key points on that. Thank you. 자, 이 원칙들을 말씀해 주셨습니다. 지금 연구의 분석 결과를 말씀해 주셨는데 그럼 질문을 드려 보겠어요. 우리 샌더 씨께서 트렌드 같은 걸 보신 게 있는지 트렌드가 올바른 단어이기를 원하는데요. Cooperation across the world because this is this is sort of what this panel is talking about the uh, the existence, the scope, the trends uh, across the certainly appreciate the principles that you outlined but the uh, if, if, if the uh, study that you were involved in uh, did get to that, it would be interesting to hear. Absolutely. So some of the trends are actually cyclical, I'd say, that you have periods of greater intensity of international joint development. Um, we're actually probably in a slightly down cycle on the cycle because F-35 was perhaps a high watermark um, for a period of our joint development, you know, with multiple partners, huge investment. Um, and the difficulties and complexities of international joint development often result in those cycles because you see some of the challenges in it and um, there is some hesitant at, at times to re-engage in them. However, you know, as you then see decline, as you then see greater pressure on R&D budgets, um, it often will then come back. Um, and looking in, on the United States side, often joint development is pursued with a goal of strengthening alliances and institutions and mul some multilateral efforts that you know, we've heard about already today. And I think that the fundamentals there and the strengths are very good. Um, the new administration has not expressed as much, as strong of an interest in some of those ideas, um, but I think we'll have to watch um, the upcoming appointees you know, the Secretary of Defense and the you know, head of acquisitions, technology, and logistics are often drivers for these sorts of projects. And as we find out who will be filling those positions, I think we'll have a stronger idea of what may be coming next there. Um, in addition, I think the other trend we've seen, and you know, the third offset strategy might not be continuing under that name but the United States has had difficulty launching major development projects in recent years because of budget constraints. And that is, I think, going to be one driver for more international joint development effort. Uh, we've seen since 2009 dramatic cuts in our R&D spending. And you know, particularly in you know, missile defense agency was one large area. And that, I think, is going to be a driver for some of the cooperative efforts we've heard about earlier. Um, and while the new administration has talked about larger budget increases, many of the increases won't necessarily take pressure off in R&D. If we're going for a 350 um, ship Navy, that's a lot of procurement dollars. Um, if we're expanding the uh, number of people in the Army, that's a lot of expense that even if you have a notable increase in the services budget, doesn't necessarily translate into R&D increases. So while we're coming down off of some larger international joint development projects, I think those indications are the cyclical indications that we may be coming back, probably first through the cooperative R&D efforts that may lay the groundwork for future international joint development. Again, uh, thank you very much. I, I think, because um, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, to moderate and I'll, I'll to continue the conversation really is what it is. I think I would, uh, I recognize that uh, 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 Mr. Shansu Kim gave some uh, specific areas that he thought of, of uh, where things could work out or, or where a focus could be. And I'd turn back to you based on the um, uh, comments, um, the observations that uh, Mr. Orman and uh, 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 have been made by Mr. Sanders. Uh, whether you'd care to continue the discussion in terms, uh, uh, Mr. Shansu Kim, in terms of what possibilities you see 
based on the principles that Mr. Sanders put out, as well as uh, what Mr. Or Orman talked about in terms of the the uh, Kendall interest and the uh, Welby interest and the, the money that's been put into S&T that you've, you've seen some specific areas. We've talked about robotics, we've talked about uh, some IT, some areas that, that, that you see in, along those lines for, uh, for international defense cooperation. Thank you. Yes, as I stated earlier, possible opportunities for joint research and development and this consultative body that I tentatively proposed when I went to the postgraduate naval school, when I studied there for one year as ESEP, as a, a researcher, I identified key success factors still, and I want to share those experiences with you. As Greg mentioned earlier, joint research is quite complicated and multifaceted. Just goodwill is not enough. That's one big understanding that I got. When I attended postgraduate naval school, this is what I share with my colleagues back then. When, when it comes to unmanned uh, uh, vehicles that we or the Navy want to operate in the East Sea and the Navy, uh, West Sea, we wanted to pursue a long-term project. Likewise, even on the, on the side of the United States, vis-a-vis -vis South China Sea, glide or similar system, the U.S. Uh, is pursuing developing, or rather was about to pursue developing uh, unmanned systems. So, so we identified a shared goal, so that enabled us to meet frequently. But there was another catalyst, which is quite interesting. This catalyst was really about funding, because there was an incentive for funding, and there was sequestration law, and it decreased by 425% every year. When it comes to a, a less attractive a project, funding became increasingly difficult, and there was a proposition, maybe if funding is offered by Korea, then we can launch a joint research. So that was a catalyst, which required a lot of long-term joint uh, cooperation, when we really can identify a shared goal, there was possibility. That's a lesson that I learned back then. So when it comes to South China Sea and the West Sea that we share with China, the U.S., when it comes to unmanned a system, deep sea becomes the fora to operate it. That applies to submarines. But if the, the battles occur in the shallow seas, and we lack technology in that area, but we do have technology in developing weapons in that shallow sea environment. So tapping into mutual or each other's uh, technological know-how, I think we can find some common opportunity. And the background against all that was this. It's all coming from my own personal experience, visiting, working in the U.S. Institute, and sharing views with my human colleagues, I guess, that really catapulted this joint thinking. And we went back to the funding issue eventually. However, when it comes to the joint recognition that we can identify and lay down a roadmap, that really opened up a lot of possibilities in a positive sense. Of course, economic and other financial issues will have to be inevitably involved but the, the small committee that I propose tentatively, I think can serve as some kind of channel, assuming some issues will be addressed. There is some opportunity that we can lay down and offer on the table. Based on that, I think in that subcommittee setting, we can really create a long-term roadmap and we can work on that roadmap, identify uh, uh, items that are incubatable and implementable. And I think that will be more practical than other ideas. Just because there is a reshuffling of the ministers or secretaries, we have to really react to that on the spur of the moment. I think we'll have to just uh, start from scratch and just we'll have to just disregard all the previous work. So we really want to think a long term and just continue to work on it and incubate it when the consultative body, which I just proposed, is formed, that we can really more actively uh, act into it. And by continuing, uh, just uh, uh, continuously sharing human resources between our two governments, which will lay a firm foundation for our joint research. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very, uh, very clear uh, what, what your, your 
is, I would uh, then continuing the discussion, and I would say in a few minutes I would intend to open the uh, questions, of course, uh, from the floor. But I, I would like uh, to ask you, uh, Mr. Orman, having listened to uh, uh, Mr. Shansu's, uh, Shansu Kim's um, idea of a committee, a subcommittee, if I under, uh, understood it correctly, if, and I, I don't want to intend to or anything put you on the spot, but it, I just thought that would be, uh, I'd ask you for your thinking. There has been, as you pointed out, several specific point-to-point uh, -point, uh, s and T efforts. My understanding of his idea is a more longer standing um, by or multilateral committee uh, that would um, consider and germinate uh, potential cooperative R&D. Do I have that essentially correctly, sir? So then I would turn it over to you, to sir. sir. Yes, yeah, so, so thank you. Um, I mean, we're certainly not opposed to some of those ideas. Uh, and I believe that um, under Keith Webster, who runs our OSD International Cooperation Group, that uh, Matt Warren, who's his deputy, is looking at some of some of those ideas in particular that were raised during the recent visit from uh, by ADD to the to Washington to visit with um, uh, with uh, Ms. Mary Miller, who's the principal deputy assistant secretary of defense for research and engineering. And there was a subsequent meeting with Mr. Webster, and some of these things were discussed. And so I think they're talking about some of those ideas. I mean, clearly the, the key thing is to find, I, like you said, areas of mutual interest, areas where we have scientists and engineers that we can exchange. And we have a scientist and engineer exchange program that uh, we certainly try to foster to help the service, but that's typically led by the services in terms of individual opportunities. But OSD is very supportive of those opportunities. And then those things lead to the generation of ideas where there could be mutual investment and collaboration in a meaningful way. So, um, I mean, we're certainly uh, interested in those ideas that, that enable our scientists and engineers to get together and work on things that make a real difference with the goal of ultimately putting something into the field and in the hands of uh, soldiers and sailors, airmen and marine. So. And thank you. And I will we'll open the uh, to the floor, questions from the floor. As was uh, stated uh, when the minister took questions, I would, I, I think the panel, and of course they should be, uh, the questions should be addressed uh, to the panel at large or to individual manners, uh, members of the panel, should be uh, questions. Um, so please, uh, we've had a good discussion. And I hope that uh, there are questions uh, for the panel members. Uh, Mr. Hunter. Hi, Andrew Hunter from CSIS again. Um, you know, an issue was brought forward very strongly in the minister's speech that I I didn't get a chance to ask him about, so I'm going to ask uh, this panel instead. Uh, but he talked about uh, how, uh, you know, obviously in the relationship uh, on technology, uh, and Dr. Hamry references in his remarks that historically it has been U.S. technology, U.S. products going to Korea, uh, sometimes for production there, uh, and sometimes just as a purchase uh, straight out. Uh, but that's changing, and uh, the minister talked about the fact that the, the Korea has made a lot of progress on a number of areas of technology, some of which he specifically mentioned. Uh, but uh, part of my training is as an economist. And so when I think about the term comparative advantage, uh, it doesn't require any particular nation to actually be the world leader in a given area 
for them to have a comparative advantage. It simply has to be an area of strength within their economy. Uh, and even if they're trading with a partner who also has that as an area of strength, they may have a comparative advantage uh, based on the overall structure of their economy. So I would be interested in your thoughts uh, on the areas where uh, you see comparative advantage on either side, uh, the U.S. comparative advantage uh, and the, the Korean comparative advantage, because it is, it is inherently uh, about the two economies and how they relate to one another. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Dr. Yildong Kim, do you care to begin the response with that? Well, uh, as I have spoken before, within Korea, there have been uh, many researches done on the uh, international technolo technologies when it comes to defense. If the uh, U.S. has 100% uh, of the technologies, uh, Korea is at about 80%. Uh, uh, so we lack about 20%. Uh, that's our internal studies. Uh, so we are about 20% behind the, the U.S. when it comes to defense-related uh, technologies. So if you were to compare it uh, at absolute level, uh, Korea is uh, still uh, behind uh, the U.S. And as such, uh, we can't look at it on, on an overall basis only. Uh, but I think it's important for us to look uh, at a more system-to-system -system, uh, level. Uh, so we don't want to be limiting ourselves to certain technologies only. Uh, we, Korea, uh, when it comes to T50, uh, we had imported uh, from GE the engines. Uh, but it was not a direct import, uh, but we bring the parts uh, to Korea and we do assembly in Korea. Uh, when it comes to assembly, uh, we do quite well in Korea. So uh, that was, uh, that I believe is uh, one of the areas where we have a relative advantage uh, to the U.S. Uh, so the ability of Korea to assemble and produce uh, certain uh, products uh, would be an advantage that the Korea can uh, put forward. Uh, and as to the absolute technology itself, uh, as it's been spoken of before, there are certain uh, areas uh, where the uh, USFK uh, could uh, benefit uh, from the abilities that the Korea uh, has. Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. In particular, uh, considering the technology uh, that we have developed uh, in Korea in light of the geology of Korea, and in particular, as uh, spoken of earlier, uh, in shallow waters, the ability to detect uh, submarine activities, uh, we do better uh, in Korea because uh, that's what we were exposed to and that's where we had focused on. And also the ability to detect uh, mines uh, in the mountainous uh, terrains, I think we do quite well. Uh, so these are some of the areas that uh, we might be able to contribute. Yes, thank you very much. Um, more questions, additional questions. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, I thought I saw a hand come up. Yes, ma'am. If you'd introduce yourself and, and then, of course, the question. Chelsea Gannon, State Department. Uh, could you speak a little bit more about the cybersecurity of the region, please? I, I could not hear that. I guess I got it. Uh, the cybersecurity of the region. Well, Mr. Shansun Kim, that would be potentially for years, you being in the research area. Yes, it's a tough question indeed. Regarding cybersecurity recently, North Korea, of course, is a nuclear threat, but also it's an SLBM threat. But on top of that, it's a threat in other senses. 
uh, we are indeed attacked in reality in cyber domain. How should we cope with that and respond to that has been an area of a lot of soul searching on our part. When it comes to attack, per se, uh, it is a, a, a prohibited by the international law, but North Korea still does it. So how can we really defend ourselves against that has been our key focus. When it comes to IT, South Korea, I think we have a lot of advantage. But when it comes to cybersecurity, we still have a lot of concerns. So like nuclear issues, I think it is equally important, if not less, if not more. So we are carrying out a long-term strategic development for technology. This area is also not confined to South Korea. It's a global issue, an issue that is shared globally and then needs to be tackled on a global scale as well. And some of the government websites have been hacked. And the uh, agricultural cooperation uh, website has been hacked by, uh, you know, some entities. So this is a sensitive issue. But still, this is a multilateral and global issue that deserves uh, multilateral and joint research. Of course, there will be certain areas where the nation's uh, unique uh, security interest has to be considered on top of everything else. But there is ample opportunity uh, for joint research through perhaps, as I mentioned, uh, sharing of human resources and identifying the area for joint research. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, additional question. Did I see a hand in the back? Yes, I did. Thank Don you. Don Brown, uh, Renaissance Advisors. Mr. Kim, could you comment on your R&D priorities in space systems, particularly protected tactical space systems. Toward Mr. Uh, Il Dong Kim, Dr. Il Dong Kim. Usually, when it comes to space technology, Korea is also advancing itself and investing a lot in R&D. When it comes to Korea's R&D policy, the space technology well, actually uh, has its own unique space. Our key priority goes to threat that is posed by North Korea, which is an asymmetric threat that includes long-range missiles and the nuclear threats and submarines. And our capability to respond to that has always taken the key priority in our policy and R&D policy as well. Such North Korean threats need to be identified early on and tackled and responded to accurately or we really have to really uh, precisely attack the source of those threats. That has been our key focus. And when it comes to space technology, how we can really tie that in into that key priority that we already have in place. You know, uh, air to surface uh, inductive uh, weapons could be one example. And recently, and reconnaissance satellites uh, we are planning to have them by early 2020. So when it comes to IT or information capability, that has become our new key priority. When it comes to combat aerial vehicle, F-35 is planning to be introduced by, uh, from the United States, and KFX and other domestic uh, aerial vehicles will have to be enhanced in that uh, aspect. So I can really assure you that we are uh, doing a lot of R&D expenses and uh, investment in that area as well. Thank you, Doctor. Another question. I, I have one, if I may be allowed. Uh, both the minister and several members of the panel uh, mentioned uh, beyond bilateral but joint, and, and you, doctor, mentioned specifically uh, Singapore, Japan, Korea, and the United States, if I recall correctly, in terms of, of uh, multilateral. And, I, and then I was thinking about the comments that uh, 
uh, Mr. Shansu, Shansu Kim made about the uh, subcommittee kind of thing, and it made me wonder, and uh, Mr. Hunter didn't say, I've retired from the uh, OSD more than three years ago, so I just don't know the answer to this question. Are there uh, bodies in existence that, that uh, would enable the multilateral, as apparently there are bilateral communications between the uh, United States and the Republic of Korea, are there the multilateral ones <clears throat> that exist uh, that also would enable the, um, the more multilateral uh, S&T or R&D cooperation uh, that you were all talking about? And I'd ask you, D uh, Dr. Kim, and <coughs> excuse me, Dr. Hildong Kim, but then um, I also thought maybe Ms. Orman would have an opportunity to comment on that. First of all, in my view, multilateral cooperation is such that we really cannot sim simply confine it to R&D only. It goes further beyond that because it's really a part of our security framework, which is on a multilateral level. I think that should be our approach. If it is only about Korea-US uh, alliance, but we really got to view it in the context of the threat that comes from North Korea and other nations that are affected by that threat in that Asia-Pacific region, maybe five to six countries, if they join hands and work together and respond to that more effectively, the message will be strong, and I think it will carry very strong implication vis-a-vis -vis the North. And not only science and uh, technology aspect, but also overall uh, security cooperation in the international domain will be significantly meaningful. Secondly, when it comes to organization, I have a, uh, 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 one quick point that I want to make. When it comes to multilateral cooperative framework between our two nations and uh, the the Deputy Secretary and the uh, Deputy Minister, rather Minister Chen, uh, has DTIC, DTIIC, that is, and there are working level meetings, which is called uh, TCSC, the overall direction of these consultative uh, bodies, I think can be uh, reasonably discussed. <coughs> However, with one condition, when it comes to detailed, tasks to be identified. I think our two governments, if we could uh, actually uh, form and, uh, and support a, a, a joint project a task force that really gathers together all the engineers and working level people, I think that will be one practical idea. Thank you, Dr. Norman. And so, um, so to address the issue of a, of a body that does it, it doesn't, um, to the best of my knowledge, there's not one that exists similar to other international cooperation frameworks such as NATO or TTCP, uh, the Five Eyes Organization for Doing Capabilities and Research Development. Uh, this said, uh, it is my understanding that uh, in a recent conversation between the U.S. and the Republic of Korea, this idea has been broached, and there's a discussion ongoing inside the department uh, with OSD policy and with international cooperation to look if there could be something like this created, at least on an informal basis initially, uh, obviously more to follow if, uh, depending on how successful the idea is. But while there isn't one now, there's certainly an, an inter interest in having a discussion about it at this point. Thank you, Dale. Any additional questions from the audience? Mr. Hunter. I'm going to be greedy and ask uh, one more. Uh, I wanted to ask about innovation. Uh, and this is something that has been very uh, much of a hot topic in the United States. Uh, the United States Congress has proposed to reorganize the uh, Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition Technology and Logistics so that it is, in their view, more focused on innovation. Um, the current Secretary of Defense, Dr. Ash Carter, uh, both established 
a Defense Innovation Advisory Board and has, as one of the recommendations of that board, endorsed creating uh, a Chief Innovation Officer for the United States uh, Department of Defense. Uh, and if there's any individual currently serving who would fit that description, it would be uh, Steve Welby, who Dale uh, has referenced and for whom he works. Uh, so uh, my question is uh, uh, really to both sides, I guess to both Dale uh, and to our, uh, the, our, our friends from Korea, as to uh, the role that a chief innovation officer uh, might play in promoting uh, cooperative research and development and the utility of cooperative research and development, specifically in trying to insert more innovation into acquisition. And then my question to uh, the Korean side is, is there any comparable individual uh, on your side who serves as the chief innovation officer or who could, who could potentially be a partner, uh, if, assuming that, that this uh, nascent uh, function uh, is established in the U.S. government? Uh, thank you, Mr. Hutter. Well, the, uh, the second part of his question, I think I'd, I'd turn to uh, you, Mr. Shansu Kim, since you're uh, running the technology area. And then the uh, first part of the question, I would turn over to you, uh, Dr. Il Dong Kim. So either one of you can speak first. Doctor. So uh, I'm not a, a doctor, actually. I'm sorry. I'm uh, in the process of getting my doctorate. So I'm still a student. Uh, you continue to address me as a doctor, so I uh, thought I should bring that up. Uh, I apologize for late uh, pointing out. When it comes to Korea, the government of uh, Madame Park uh, we have an uh, innovative uh, economy as uh, the creative uh, economy as uh, the uh, government's uh, slogan. So not only in the areas of uh, defense and security, but also in the overall economy. Uh, that's where we are headed, a creative, uh, innovative uh, economy. So uh, everybody's always uh, focusing and uh, stressing uh, creativity and innovation. But it's uh, easy to say, but hard to define sometimes. So when you say innovation, uh, I think uh, we, it's, a, it's a way of uh, solving a problem, right? Uh, you, you start with a problem, and then you try to uh, solve it by a creative, innovative mechanisms. So where do you find these uh, creativity or innovation? And particular when it comes to acquisition, uh, in the U.S. you have uh, DARPA where we uh, benchmark, and uh, in uh, Korea uh, we are trying to have a, a Korean uh, DARPA uh, within the Agency for Defense uh, Development (ADD). Uh, again, uh, our focus uh, really revolves around the uh, problem that is uh, North, North Korea. And as to the threats posed by North Korea, how are we going to address uh, some of the uh, uh, threats, uh, uh, compartmentalized uh, threats? And uh, that's uh, where we are focusing on. Uh, how do we address these various uh, compartmentalized uh, threats? And you say innovation. Uh, and well, Everybody uh, who is involved in these areas, I think we need to change our minds, uh, change our perspectives, the mindsets. And so we look at the problem, although it may be an old problem, uh, but approach it uh, from a new uh, perspective. Uh, that's uh, where we need to do what we need to do. As I checked, and it is uh, Mr. Shan Su Kim who is the one with the PhD, and so I won't make that mistake again. But I learned it uh, rather late this morning. Do you have? Uh, do you want to? Uh, because I had intended uh, 
Dr. Shan Tzu Kim, to ask you because of your uh, involvement and, and your colleague has already mentioned uh, the ADD, but if you had something to add in terms of innovation and, and where it might be. Well, uh, we do quite a bit of work at ADD. And then uh, we hear about this innovation, uh, creativity. I mean, we hear it every day. <laughs> so it's uh, something that's uh, here uh, with us. Uh, and we do a lot of planning, of course, uh, as a research uh, center. Uh, there is a PPBS in US, uh, which does a 15-year uh, programming. And uh, every five years, there is a peri periodic review, I understand. And so. Uh, 15 years, uh, if you were to uh, plan for 15 years, uh, it becomes a long-term uh, planning. Uh, and this is uh, something uh, that requires a rigid uh, budgeting and funding. But uh, when you have long-term projects, uh, you have a problem because uh, it, for short terms, uh, you have a hard time responding. Uh, the flexibility is no longer uh, there. Uh, you can't adapt as fast. So uh, when you say innovation, uh, we are not trying to have a rapid uh, turnaround or rapid changes. Uh, we are actually looking long term and then uh, thinking in a more creative uh, ways. And of course, uh, we would have fast tracks uh, within these long-term plannings. So allow for uh, short-term uh, changes. And I believe that's actually an area of uh, innovation that we have uh, put into the system that uh, for our long terms, that we actually allow for uh, short-term changes and uh, that allow, we allow for uh, fast uh, tracks now. And that's uh, where the innovation is uh, for now uh, at the moment in Korea. Now, uh, innovation, it's about change, right? And do you lead the change or do you adapt uh, to the change? Uh, for now, we have been uh, responding uh, to the changes. Uh, we are trying to adapt uh, to the changes. And that's uh, been our creative uh, strategy, uh, that uh, we are able to adapt uh, uh, to the rapidly changing uh, situations. Uh, that's uh, where our focus had been. Uh, for uh, thus far, uh, I, that may change into the future. Uh, but uh, when it comes to innovation, I, I think it's important that everybody uh, is on the same page, that everybody's always looking for ways to make it better, uh, do something better, and also be able to respond uh, to the changes uh, better. So that's where we are as far as the uh, innovation is. And so who actually uh, would be leading uh, this uh, type of uh, change? Well, the government would have to do that, but who within the government uh, should uh, do that? Uh, well, it's uh, somebody who has the, a creative mind, of course, and who also understands not just the government, but also the private industry, uh, who would be able to tap into the creative energies uh, in, from the private industry. That's the person. Thank you, sir. Uh, that, <coughs> excuse me, that concludes this panel. Uh, the next panel starts in about uh, 10 minutes. Uh, there is coffee out in the atrium. Again, thank you all very much. And of course, very uh, thank you all, uh, panel members, for your uh, uh, presentations, your discussions, your replies uh, to the questions. It was quite, a, quite an interesting session. And thank you. The next panel, which is specifically on industrial, I believe, R&D cooperation, is at 11.15. Uh, Thank you. Uh, they have the unfortunate task of going second, which means that there's much that's already been said, but there's, there's more genius still to come. Uh, we have moderating this great session, to whom I will very shortly turn this over, uh, Mr. Frank Kenlon, uh, another former colleague of mine from the Office of Secretary of Defense Acquisition Technology and Logistics. Uh, Frank was the uh, Deputy Director and for a time also Acting Director of the International Cooperation Office uh, within uh, the Secretary of Defense's office. Uh, he serves currently as a professor at the Defense Acquisition University, so he literally uh, teaches 
teaches the course on international uh, uh, industrial co uh, cooperation uh, for uh, the defense acquisition system, and he's going to lead uh, our panel, uh, our second panel. So thank you, Frank. Over to you. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, that's a, thanks for the great introduction. I'd like to briefly introduce our uh, panel members today. There's uh, Major General O oh, to my uh, immediate uh, right, who's the Director General of the Defense Industry Promotion Bureau at, at DAPA. Um, he served as uh, artillery brigade commander and then moved through uh, the ranks um, and then eventually uh, through the Korean Armed Forces and uh, joined uh, DARPA in January 2015. Um, he'll, I'll give him a chance to introduce himself in a second, uh, but uh, the second um, panel member is Mr. Yi, who is uh, from Korean, uh, Korea Aerospace Industries, uh, started in uh, 1988 and has worked on uh, programs including uh, T-50 and F-A-50. And um, uh, he's uh, uh, an engineer by training. So congratulations for that. I, I was a history major. I couldn't quite hack the math. Um, the um, Dak Hardwick is a, a colleague of mine who I've worked with uh, Dak and his, his uh, colleague Remy Nathan at AIA. I have a long-standing working relationship with them. Um, uh, he's uh, assistant vice president there and uh, has uh, worked uh, in uh, uh, Marine Corps and also has a, a master's in public administration from West Virginia. So he'll talk a little bit more about the AIA perspective as things move on. And then lastly, at the far end, my colleague uh, uh, Rick uh, Weir. I uh, also worked with Rick back in my uh, full-time work days in uh, Northrop Grumman uh, in terms of uh, aerospace sector, particularly uh, uh, we met in the unmanned aerial systems area. He's another engineer as well as uh, having other uh, a master's in uh, military operational s sciences from Air University. So um, in a minute, we'll start with a presentation from General O. Oh, but is there anything each one of you would like to say uh, in terms of your uh, background before we get started? Actually, I'll correct. I'm not an engineer. I was a chemist. A chemist. <laughs> a chemist. Engineers make things. So you are actually an original on. thinker rather than a derivative yeah, right. thinker. <laughs> I used to tell the engineers that they didn't appreciate that at all. So. Very good. Good afternoon. I am Major General Oh, and I come from DAPA. My key tasks are domestically, the defense industry, develop policies and support them and carry out international cooperation in terms of defense export in particular. And when it comes to military area vehicles, certification is another key area. So these are threefold key tasks that I perform every day. As I prepare presentation, I prepare only three pages. This uh, presentation, uh, in context with the key note speech and the panel one discussion, has already been covered by them already. Regarding this slide, there has been much discussion already, so I'll briefly touch upon this. As you know very well, Korea has a history of 50 years. Actually, we had to go through the war for three years back in 1950. Since then, those Korea provoked continuously, and provocations are continuing even as I speak in this place. And the Korean Peninsula, geo geographically speaking, has a lot of ramification for security landscape in Northeast Asia and in the global community. And it's a continued threat. As you know very well, North Korea recently performed a fifth nuclear test and has carried out provocative missile test. And SLBM is continued to be a threat and is becoming more of a real threat. And to respond to that effectively, Korea ROK has promoted the uh, defense industry, which uh, Minister Chang has elaborated on before already. So I'll just briefly touch upon that. In the 50s and 60s after the Korean War, we depended on 
the U.S. Defense Forces. And in the 70s, we had a nascent shape where we focused on the basic articles, where we made them domestically. And back then, we tried to achieve self-defense, and ADD was uh, created in 1970. And in the 1980s, we tried to develop and imp uh, improve upon the advanced systems that were already developed by the advanced nations, which we dub as growth stage. And the 90s is defined as the takeoff stage where we independently carried our research. And since 2000, we enter into the advanced nations ranks, we believe. And for that purpose, in 2006, a DAPA Act was promulgated and DAPA was created accordingly an open competitive system became the mantra. So the previous system was discarded in 2008, and we launched into a new phase of weapon system development. Next slide talks about the size and the policy of the defense industry in the ROK. The defense industry scope compared to that of the United States is very small. That's how probably you feel. However, the size of the defense industry and its competitiveness is stands at $10.4 billion annually, and much of it is actually driven by the expenses by the large companies, which is often called Chebol. And the DAPA identifies 10 comp 100 companies, rather, and including all the subcontractors and uh, contractors. We have more than 5,000 uh, companies that are involved in the manufacturing uh, the processes, Hanwha, Kai, Hyundai, Pungsan are the major uh, industry uh, players, as uh, discussed in session one. Uh, defense R&D in Korea is about two billion dollars for R&D for defense, and it accounts for six percent of our entire military budget. As you can see from the right hand side, our competitiveness is such compared to U.S and other advanced nations, I think we stand at around 80% level. And I think when it comes to competitiveness, I think we stand at around 50%. If you look at the bottom right side, as we enter into the post-Cold War era in the 1990s, there was a paradigm, paradigm shift in uh, the uh, defense industry. We felt the need for that. So the market structure changed when uh, it was driven by a monopoly and protection by the government. Now we are moving away from that so that we can enter into the open, competitive global market structure. Increasingly, one source was developed by one company only, but now it's not so anymore. So there is a healthy level of competition by making one source uh, handled by several players. Also, the key players uh, is changing where in the past it was just government and government only. Now the private sector is involving more actively. Previously it was the ADD or within the umbrella of Ministry of Defense. But when it comes to the key core technology, still the key player is ADD. However, when it comes to other technologies, we uh, let the private sector drive the effort and play a key role. And when it comes to the scope of the industry, it, we've been focused on the military capability of the ROK, ROK armed forces. However, not only ROK armed forces, but military export is another key area that we are increasingly keen on. And the level of cooperation was where we really tend to be more independent and uh, drove our own effort. But, but we are now increasingly focusing on joint effort and multilateral effort as well. Given this paradigmatic change, our policy direction can be summed up this way. Of course, the domestic industry market needs to be enhanced in terms of its competitive edge so that we can continue to work on our core capability. And based on that, the quality of the defense industry can become sophisticated and stabilized. Once we equip ourselves with this competitive edge, then we can launch into the next phase of the, in, uh, the defense industrial market. This is the four-step approach, which is is the major policy direction. Next slide talks about US ROK defense industry cooperation and its direction down the road. Of course, when it comes to the scope of our cooperation, we maintain it at a high level as is seen at the right hand chart. From the Korean perspective, about 75% comes from the United States, 
whether it is FMS or commercial dealings or transactions, but from the U.S. standpoint, Korea still plays a main major role, and our uh, defense market cannot be uh, uh, just taken lightly. And second point in this slide is that the governments and the industry players, they need to pay more attention and uh, have more interest in that because of the, the offset program and whatnot. There is some strategic effort to tap into that, and our two governments and private consultative bodies need to actively support that. That's how we feel. When it comes to defense cooperation, the most successful study case, which was mentioned in uh, session one, I think T50 was very successful. To further build upon that, we need to make joint efforts. And our two governments and two countries, which area each come country has a uh, relative competitive advantage. We need to uh, define that and go into joint research, joint marketing, and joint fielding. Down the road, we believe that we need to continuously acknowledge the need for defense research jointly and find areas to implement them so that we can implement the defense a joint defense industrial base. As it was discussed, we need to actively research together. And so far, w when we purchased our acquired weapon system uh, from uh, the U.S. offset uh, revolved around the technology and technological cooperation. I think it will have to be uh, shifted toward the response purchase when it comes to export, export permit. Currently, we are actively using technology that was developed by the United States, but when it's transferred to third countries, we need to play more, uh, have more flexibility, to my understanding. And last but not least, Korean companies and their opportunities to join U.S. defense companies as subcontractors need to be enhanced. As stated earlier, certain areas are where Korean companies have reached a very high level and as Minister Chang mentioned, we used to be an importer. Now, to a certain degree, we have turned ourselves into an exporter to a certain degree. And given that current status, we need to find areas for mutual benefit. I believe this will go a long way toward having more partners and uh, benefiting our both nations. That concludes my <coughs> brief presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. much, uh, General, for, well, I hit it the wrong way. Sorry about that. The, um, thanks for such an insightful presentation. I'd be remiss in uh, not uh, mentioning the fact that it's uh, a great honor to be here with our Korean colleagues uh, today. Um, uh, certainly from my standpoint, I've had the good fortune to uh, uh, work with uh, uh, DAPA and ADD in, uh, during my full-time service, and they also uh, 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 come to uh, DAU, Defense Acquisition University, where I work now, and um, uh, meet and discuss uh, defense acquisition topics with us as well, which is um, uh, a wonderful way to uh, begin uh, cooperation. We'd obviously like to expand that cooperation. I think it's uh, probably well known here, but suffice to say, um, when we talk about defense industrial cooperation, um, our organization, which I believe is well known, although may change, but currently we have uh, uh, OUSD acquisition technology and logistics, and they have a uh, focus in uh, defense cooperation and defense industry cooperation in three areas, um, you know, science and technology, um, applied uh, technology innovation, and of course, um, production and operations and support cooperation. So, um, as from a DAU uh, Defense Acquisition Uni University perspective, when we look at uh, international acquisition and exportability and uh, cooperation with uh, other nations, uh, particularly key, key allies such as uh, Korea, um, we uh, would like to uh, see our industries um, work together uh, across that domain, uh, including technology-based work, uh, which may or may not involve the government. They 
technology-based work may occur uh, industry to industry. Um, however, uh, we've had uh, several successful uh, cooperative programs with, uh, with uh, ADD and uh, in uh, science and technology as well as applied technology, which takes us into the second domain in terms of cooperative program work. These days, when you look at numbers, and we were just uh, met with our um, key stakeholders last week uh, in preparation for a new 300-level uh, course that we're going to teach next fall, um, most of the cooperative work uh, on a government-to-government -government basis occurs in a science and technology and applied uh, technology uh, areas, including uh, technology demonstration work. Um, full system cooperation uh, is a little bit different. Uh, we have um, full system cooperation on some of our programs uh, uh, to include in industry to industry cooperation on programs such as Joint Strike Fighter. Uh, that may occur under a cooperative program agreement or uh, a foreign military sales, direct commercial sales type <coughs> arrangement. Finally, uh, as uh, General O mentioned, uh, we also look uh, for international uh, contracting and foreign sources for all our programs, which may or may not have um, <clears throat> a foreign partner or customer involved. And that includes uh, not only prime contractor opportunities, but uh, uh, subcontractor and supplier opportunities. So his mention of the fact that um, the Korean industry, defense industry in particular, is uh, and perhaps dual use industry as well, is going to uh, hopefully um, go beyond their more traditional focus, which I've been familiar with, vis-a-vis uh, -vis their uh, domestic market and serving their domestic market and attempting to uh, become uh, more robust players in the uh, uh, global defense marketplace, including the U.S. defense market, which, is, as we all know, is, is one of the largest uh, defense markets in the world. So um, that, uh, as an overview, is a, a brief government perspective in response to his uh, wonderful and thoughtful presentation. I thought it, it was... Uh, if only in the Pentagon we could take 50 chart briefings and make them into briefings as effective as his three chart briefing. So thank you for that. Um, I'd like to turn it over to, to Dak Hardwick uh, at AIA for uh, some opening thoughts on the U.S. side and then followed by Rick. And then perhaps we can uh, engage in some uh, question and answer and discussion. Very good, uh, Frank. Thank you very much. Uh, let me thank the the, my friends here at CSIS for the opportunity to be on this panel with such distinguished folks uh, from not only the U.S. side, uh, Mr. Weir, but also from the Korean side as well. Uh, we've had a long relationship with CSIS, and I know the 300-plus member companies of the Aerospace Industries Association of the U.S. Um, are excited to be represented and to be here. I uh, want to do a couple things with uh, my remarks. Uh, the first thing is I want to provide some baseline facts and figures just to set the stage for my comments. I want to provide everybody a sense of what AIA intends to focus on in 2017 with the presidential transition um, ongoing as it is right now, especially as it relates to security cooperation. Um, I will say a word or two, but only a word or two about defense offsets. Um, uh, I do want to talk a little bit about commercial trade and how commercial trade is impacting the defense trade between the U.S. and Korea. Uh, I also want to talk very briefly about commercialization and how commercialization is driving technology security and technology development. And finally, I'm going to provide you just a very short uh, personal election observation that I think came out of the first panel uh, to give you a sense of what I think 2017 looks like. So let's do facts and figures first. Um, and I think this is important for us to baseline generally where we are. The first is the U.S. aerospace sales constituted 63% of Korea's total aerospace imports. So that's from 2015, and that's from the U.S. Department of Commerce. Total U.S. aerospace exports to Korea exceeded 4.4 billion U.S. dollars, uh, and that includes both civil and defense-related products. Korea was the 10th largest market for the U.S. aerospace exports in 2015, and that's from uh, the Korean International Trade Association. Uh, on a five-year average, 
from 2010 to 2014, the U.S. defense products accounted for around 85% of Korea's total defense imports. And uh, as we at AIA like to talk about uh, the positive nature of defense trade, the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement provided for duty-free exports of U.S. aerospace products since 2012. So one of the things I'd like for you to consider is that the, global, that the aerospace sector, regardless of whether it's from the U.S. or from Korea, is in fact a global aerospace sector. And so both countries are operating within a global environment that while the bilateral relationship is important, that we have a global environment that we are working with. So for 2017, with the presidential transition in front of us, uh, AIA is gonna to look to a number of different things related to security cooperation and defense trade. But one of the things that we're really gonna focus on is streamlining the technology review and contracting process for priority regions in security cooperation. Uh, that means some key items for the U.S. and for our Korean colleagues. Uh, greater clarity in the policies and processes related to the technology security and foreign disclosure process, especially as it relates to unmanned aerial systems. Also, we're going to look to better caseload management techniques for export of items that exist on the U.S. munitions list. Uh, obviously, uh, given the first panel's discussion about technology, technology reviews and technology security, we think the time is right, not necessarily just for our Korean colleagues, but also for the worldwide global aerospace sector that we continue to focus on technology security and technology development, R&D overall. Uh, that will lead to my comment later about how commercialization is driving the defense market. The other thing that AIA has been famous for over the last number of years is export control reform. We will continue our efforts on export control reform uh, but we'll also look to our colleagues in the U.S. government about what the next steps associated with export control reform are. One of the key items there might be the concept of something called a program license or program licensing, where you might be able to uh, license an entire program and for not only the, uh, the initial procurement of that item, but also all of the follow-on. Uh, that you would need to maintain that item. You could have under a blanket program license rather than individual licenses, uh, which would streamline the licensing process. Uh, I wanna say a few words about offsets very quickly. Um, and I'm gonna use a, a, a term of art here. Uh, I, I talk about offsets with my US government colleagues uh, a lot. And uh, I find that when I use the word offsets, uh, suddenly they start staring at the ceiling and staring at their shoes and start looking around. And, and one of the things that I think that we can talk about is how offsets is, a good offsets program can be uh, helpful for both uh, the country that is providing the goods, but also the country that is importing the goods. Uh, we should continue to develop the positive relationships that the U.S. and the, and the Korean side have engendered over the last 30 plus years of an offsets program. Uh, what I would say in general is, uh, again, term of art, the offsets tail should not wag the defense trade dog. Uh, we wanna make sure that uh, both are seen equally. Uh, on the commercial trade, I do wanna make a, a point about how commercial trade and defense trade, while the numbers may be stark, the skill sets associated with commercial trade and defense trade are in fact the same. So many of the factories and many of the skill sets that workers have that are manufacturing uh, uh, parts to, that go into aerospace and defense equipment also go into defense equipment. And the commercial trade, uh, efforts on commercial trade to enhance that commercial trade is something that we need to pay particular, particular mind to because uh, commercial trade continues to drive, globally continues to drive the worldwide aerospace market. Uh, even though uh, the military or the defense trade market in Korea does overshadow the civil trade a bit, globally commercial trade continues to uh, be the dominant sector over defense trade. Uh, I wanna say something about commercialization very quickly. Um, so uh, commercial R&D development, and we see this on a global scale, Commercial R&D development is rapidly changing the way in which defense trade operates. So we're, we are coming to a point, I think, in technology security and technology reviews where commercial products are quickly 
quickly outpacing government research and development opportunity or government research and development programs for, for no other reason than sheer size of the market. Commercialization, commercial products, commercial, uh, commercial uh, economies are really pushing uh, technology development, R&D development, and what that is going to do largely is find us uh, having a discussion about how much can the technology be controlled. Uh, is, are we at a point where is, is technology control the right way to go, or do we have to, have to work, find another, I don't want to say regime, but find another mechanism that protects research and development technologies uh, that is able to provide a level of security for both partners uh, while at the same time recognizing that the commercial market is really driving a larger, uh, driving the conversation here. And finally, let me say, just make a personal observation about a comment that was made relative to the presidential transition in the last panel. The comment that was made was the, the president-elect has signaled uh, the desire for allies to uh, take on more of the burden sharing associated with their own defense. I think that's an interesting comment that will be explored going going further. But for our Korean colleagues in the room, I think you have to look to yourselves as a country that is doing just that. Uh, and, the num and I don't have any other data to support that other than the fact of the sheer numbers in economics over the past five years. There has been significant investment in the defense trade in Korea that uh, at least from a personal observation and from analysis indicates to me that uh, there is a commitment on the Korean side to have that self, to um, acknowledge that self-defense, to, to increase its indigenous production, uh, to work toward a research and development cooperative, work with and work toward a research and development co cooperative programs that I think leads to um, a good news story going forward with our partners and allies. So, uh, Frank, with that, I will stop and turn it back over to you. Thank you, and, and if you don't mind, um, you might want to hit your mic. Sure. Point. Um, <clears throat> especially the last point, and, and also General O addressed it earlier, the fact that Korea has made enormous progress, I think, in going from what was a small, less than five billion dollar a year defense export program with a goal or an aspiration to get to a 20 billion dollar aspiration program. I think the trajectory is in the right direction, but hopefully through some of our dialogue today we might get in, gain some insight into what might be done better. And so while Dak's uh, discussion was a, li a little more positive, I think I'll like to highlight a few more of, of the negative aspects and particularly focus on offsets uh, as maybe one of those things we might find an area of improvement. Historically, the defense relationship between um, Korean industry and U.S. industry has been uh, determined by offset programs, <clears throat> which are never beneficial to either side uh, because there's a cost associated to one side and there's a, a, release technolo a technology release challenge for the other side. Um, access to, to defense industry in Korea has also been governed by DAPA, where assigned projects and assigned programs have been the norm rather than fostering a true sense of competition where U.S. industry can seek and find a competitor that's likely matched uh, or a technology specialist that is something that can enhance a project that might be done in Korea. Additionally, U.S. technology release to Korea for cooperative programs has been, uh, one might say, restricted by the U.S. government. Not in a way that seems to be nefarious, but it's, it's generally, if you talk about offsets to a U.S. government person, they do get a little introspective and a little uncomfortable because by law they can't talk about that. The only thing they can do is look at your license application. And if there isn't a robust dialogue on why you need to highlight those things that you're trying to get technology release for, it could be denied. <clears throat> U.S. defense industry partners were not interested in doing anything more than what was required historically by the Defense Offset Memorandum of Understanding or agreement. We recognize that DAPA is not an end user of the equipment. That in itself provides challenges. DAPA does own the process, does a very good job at it, has gotten better over time. And they also own that offset piece of it. The desire to sustain and grow Korea's defense, off or defense industry is a noble pursuit. We would like to be a part of that. <clears throat> 
The rigid structure of the offset program has fostered price increases and uh, restricted true or cooperative programs. Let's, let's just pause for just a moment. General Lowe talked about $40 billion as an example of a defense budget that might happen this year. Roughly three quarters of that would be for U.S. programs, whether they're a combination of foreign military sales or direct commercial sales. So let's just say foreign military sales, which has the smaller portion of an offset at about 30%. So if you say $40 billion is the budget, $30 billion is the portion that would be purchased from a U.S. Uh, entity, gen generally from the U.S. government if it's foreign military sales, roughly 30% of that would be, so we'll say $10 billion would be an offset obligation. Offsets are not free. U.S. companies do not participate in offset programs for free. And the restriction of intellectual property transfer as well as U.S. government investment by taxpayers as well as technology leading edge uh, is part of that calculus in determining whether or not an offset license will go into place. And so it's a false cooperative program if you look at an offset as a true partnership. We understand that uh, Article 19 of the, of the DAPA Act states that DAPA shall purchase domestic manufactured equipment in the first instance. The second instance would be to do something uh, that was a foreign procurement. The last instance would be uh, to seek technology transfer with a high uh, transfer element as part of its strategy to increase defense exports. But that also seems to be, from a U.S. industry perspective, a one-way street. U.S. government restricts U.S. industry's ability through the licensing of proposed offset agreements, partly, again, to protect the taxpayer and uh, technology leadership. U.S. industry also self-protects and looks for ways to avoid the sharing of technology that it has made an enormous investment of resources and manpower into uh, for a free transfer. We have seen some progress, though. Real partnering has developed, and, and I would highlight uh, Mr. Yee's company, who has done a very good job on the T-50 program with Lockheed Martin. There have been other programs that have been done by other com uh, companies, but mostly they have been done by the forced obligation of an offset. And to develop and grow those obligations, a further offset needs to be done to, uh, to force the U.S. industry hand, as it were. But we have seen some examples also in Korean industry where partnerships that started as an offset obligation have blossomed in something that is much more beneficial to both sides. And I would say second source suppliers, for instance. If you look at some of the aircraft technology that is out there on the market and the Korean industry that has been assigned by DAPA has had a, a, an opportunity to participate in building pieces of that, e, that equipment uh, and then has been able to compete in the U.S. system as a second source supplier. That is a little closer to a real cooperative partnership. The real test will be, in the absence of an offset, could a Korean firm partner with a U.S. company in development of defense or dual-use equipment that is open to a broad and global market? An example might be how the Australian uh, model has been set up, where no offset exists, but from the very beginning in, an, in a negotiation for procurement, indigenous design a, is part of the priority, as well as industrial partnering and work share suitable uh, to what is appropriate for release from the U.S. government. That is a desirable second state. To get to the point where there is real defense industrial cooperation, there are some barriers that we probably should address and need to overcome over time. One, I would say, would be U.S. licensing for defense technology cooperation. But we don't want to leave that as a, a burden on the, the shoulders of the tech release uh, organizations, which are doing their best to protect uh, U.S. taxpayer investment and, and a leading edge. But there needs to be a closer look at the relationship between the foreign policy uh, alliance management and maybe the technology release in such a way that those two entities become closer in purpose rather than further away. One is a no and one is always a yes. Some middle road in between there might be uh, a way we might look at defense technology release. Another one, uh, developing business cases wherein both parties share risk and capital investment. It's very difficult for a U.S. company to come to a foreign land and look at uh, a partnership solely as sharing of its technology or its intellectual property with very little in return. 
But if there is an opportunity where a U.S. firm can partner with a very capable firm, and in Korea there, there are tons of capable firms, um, and so there are lots of opportunities where a U.S. company, a Korean company, could look at an investment sharing proposal and uh, a management of risk in such a way that both companies are equal partners. But this seems to look at uh, a separation from the government control. On the other hand, we would like to see agreement from both governments on a standard of industrial security and protection of taxpayer investments from both sides and a defense capability jointly developed based on maybe where the alliance management would like to drive a capability. Opcon transfer would be an area that you could d detail a variety of things that might define a couple of cap or a couple capabilities where two companies, one from Korea, one from the U.S., might uh, partner. And then lastly, I, I would like to say that uh, there are a number of U.S. companies that are reaching out into Korea, not inside of industry, but inside of educational uh, institutions, uh, to look for uh, 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 internships and externships, sponsored programs, where we can develop one another's engineers, we can share those engineers in such a way that we grow capacity inside of Korea, and we look at uh, U.S. industry as a source of technology from a shared investment of personnel rather than just a gift. So I hope that that at least gives us something to ask questions about and to further dialogue. And uh, I leave that with you. Thanks. Thank you for those remarks. And um, it, uh, before we begin, we have four panel members. Mr. Yi, would you like to make any brief uh, opening yes. remarks? I, I think it only fair that we hear from the Korean industry perspective as well before we take questions. So if, if you could um, try to yeah. uh, make some brief remarks uh, and then that will leave us about 20 minutes for question and answers. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> and uh, uh, I want to speak to Korean. Okay. Uh, I represent KAI. It's my pleasure to be here. And Mr. Weir had stated just now uh, that when it comes to offset, uh, there are certain difficulties and challenges that we face. And as uh, the weaponry uh, that we purchase in Korea become more advanced and uh, get more expensive, actually, uh, and uh, we run into more problems with offset as well. Uh, so I think we're on the same page as to the difficulties, uh, the assessment as such. I think uh, we have uh, had some uh, good uh, uh, reports uh, coming back from a certain offset uh, programs uh, as well. And it hasn't always been bad. Uh, there has been a T50, which was uh, an excellent example of success. Uh, and this goes back uh, to the fighter jets that we used to purchase uh, from, Korea, uh, from the US uh, we, in the old days. And with the offset program uh, for these fighters, uh, Korea was able to have uh, manufacturing and assembly uh, facilities uh, developed and also have a better quality control. And with the T-50 offset, we actually were able to have uh, technology transfers. So th this had been a success uh, story for all of us uh, involved. And the Lockheed Martin, which uh, provided assistance uh, from a uh, domestic engineer's uh, program uh, later, uh, with the uh, TX uh, advanced uh, trainers, uh, so it became actually linked, uh, the programs. And as such, uh, about 20 years back in 1997, we discussed uh, these. Uh, that's when we when the conversation started. And uh, later, uh, in the recent years, uh, we have had uh, more uh, exchanges uh, and uh, in-depth exchanges, actually, between the two governments. And after the development of uh, these uh, train uh, f fighters, uh, we actually have been able to amass and also 
become more sophisticated uh, in the engineering capabilities uh, for these uh, fighter uh, jets. And uh, we actually learned uh, quite a bit uh, from the experience. And uh, before we used to ask for offset, now we are actually being asked uh, to provide offset uh, by these uh, potential purchasers of these uh, train uh, nurse, uh from these other companies, uh, uh, these other countries. So now we understand the problems that you had as the provider of offset. Uh, so uh, I think uh, we are beginning to walk in your shoes as well. And Kai, uh, we have learned quite a bit. And uh, I suppose uh, going forward, uh, we would be able to uh, apply what we have learned um, to our uh, relationships uh, with other uh, countries and uh, what we have learned uh, from the uh, bilateral uh, exchanges I hope uh, we can further develop uh, and have uh, better advantages uh, for both uh, sides uh, into the future so it's been a learning uh, uh, opportunity for both of us and I hope uh, we can uh, complete the journey together uh, that is a t50 thank you opening remarks and um, unlike some panels where everyone uh, uh, tends to provide a kind of a uh, uh, you know middle of the road uh, uh, perspective on things we have some different perspectives that have been expressed up here which I think is helpful to the audience and now I'd like to open it up for uh, questions please General, uh, a question for you. Uh, PJ Hart with, with Raytheon. You mentioned offsets uh, in your remarks, and uh, I think every other panelist also uh, referenced offsets. Um, I understand Korea is uh, considering making some updates to their offset policy, and one of the changes will be to try to um, further support uh, Korean companies entering into the global supply chain. Uh, I was wondering if you could speak at all about some of the, the possible, the proposed offset policy guideline changes. Um, and I would also just, just offer the comment that I understand, as of now, the multipliers that are, um, are implemented, are, are put on to uh, exports for Korean companies, range from 1.5 to 2x which looking at the, the global offset market, um, that tends to be a, a rather low multiplier for supply chain integration and, and exports. Uh, and, and I would encourage uh, DAPA to look at, at raising that threshold to f further support that, that international cooperation. From my earlier presentation, I did uh, briefly mention uh, offset, but actually that's not my area of specialty. So I apologize. I probably am not a uh, proper person uh, to respond uh, to that. In the session one, there was Director Il Tong Kim. Uh, Mr. Kim uh, would be able to respond to that better. Uh, I'll ask him to step up, actually. Uh, Well, I thought I was going to ask a question, but now I'm having to respond to a question. Well, as to the offset, we do have some policy changes uh, that are uh, in the works. Uh, they are being reviewed. Uh, they have not been finalized yet. As to the direction taken, uh, as the questioner had uh, stated, and when it comes to technology transfers, we are looking at EL and other uh, export control uh, from the US. So we have, although have certain technologies, uh, we have difficulty uh, having uh, these uh, technology transfers uh, to third countries. Uh, and we 
intend to follow the guidelines. And as to, uh, since I have a microphone actually in my hand, I might as well ask a question. Mr. Weir, uh, may I ask a question? Is that okay? Uh, as to the offset, uh, you've uh, stated quite a few things uh, which I appreciated. Uh, when you look at the global uh, scene, uh, there are about uh, 120 uh, different uh, countries uh, with offset uh, programs. Uh, so rather than FMS, uh, I, my focus would be more on the commercial side. If uh, these uh, 120 countries, if uh, Korea were not to adopt uh, these offset, then these other 120 uh, countries uh, today actually have uh, a higher uh, burden uh, because uh, Korea would no longer be a part of it. I would, I wonder if my question was uh, precise enough. Uh, so let me, uh, let me address the fact that, well, let's start with 120 different countries globally. There are, there are uh, many countries around the globe that require an offset obligation. And, and, uh, and my, my pointed remarks at the Korean offset obligation could be applied to any of those, those countries. Uh, so, uh, as a review, the, the basis of the discussion is that an offset is not a true partnership in industrial cooperation with respect to defense. That said, uh, there are a lot of countries that have less developed, less developed than Korea, uh, defense programs where uh, you might look at offsets as an initial start for them to have a program where they feel a bit of ownership in their defense budget and procurement process. Uh, but with a country like Korea that has a robust export program and a program wherein uh, you employ a number of very highly skilled and technologically advanced companies uh, around the country, uh, I think we're at a place now with respect to the U.S. partnership and defense development that we should be looking at a way to get through offsets and into more business-like practices wherein there's a shared investment, there's a shared protection of intellectual property, and there's a shared responsibility for uh, proper export of those technologies so that they're protected and they get in the hands of people who will comply with those countries' requirements. Does that answer your question? Well, if I uh, may uh, follow up on that, uh, please. For example, the Korean government, when we do commercial purchases from Northrop uh, Grumman, for example, uh, the, if the Korean government were not to use the offset, the, uh, the, would the weaponry system, uh, the purchase pr price as from the perspective of Korea, uh, would we pay less? Uh, to Northrop Grumman, or do we? Uh, what what happens to the price, purchase price? Rather than address it as a Northrop Grumman employee, let me address this as a U.S. industry representative. <laughs> Let's go back to that example of seventy-five percent of forty billion dollars being uh, leaving us with about a ten billion dollar offset program. If we're only getting multipliers of, say, two, two or even maybe three or four, if you're looking at, at uh, foreign military sales rather than commercial uh, or supply chain pieces, that has to be paid for somehow. And it is not uh, a U.S. defense industry business practice to take that out of the profit that is earned on a sale. It, it's important to note that when a foreign military sale is conducted, the U.S. government restricts the U.S. industry uh, supplier to U.S. Uh, profit margins. So if there is a, a piece of equipment that's purchased by the U.S. government for U.S. military use, the margin is restricted to a certain level. Um, when we sell a foreign piece of equipment to a, a foreign land, that margin is at that level because we sell that equipment to the U.S. government, who then in turn sells it to the Korean government. 
If we have an offset obligation where we must provide technology, there's a cost for that technology and it must be accounted for in some way. Thanks for that. Um, government representative, uh, uh, former and uh, professor of these matters, current, is that um, I used to deal and we still deal with our students who have to uh, grapple with um, work share in cooperative programs. Um, by the way, work sharing uh, does, is, uh, in a cooperative program, work sharing is permitted but no offsets are permitted by our law. I think most people know that. Uh, this this uh, if effectively forces the industries to work together uh, and um, come up with uh, uh, either best value or strategic best value solutions. And the additional cost is borne by the partner nations. So it tends to be self-regulating. In FMS, uh, foreign military sales, um, as uh, Rick has mentioned, um, the cost is generally known by the buyer because of the way the FMS system works. But um, if you take, for example, uh, uh, an FMS program that were to pursue effectively a work sharing type arrangement where the costs were of industrial cooperation were focused solely on that work done for the program, which is also known as a direct offset in many circles. That also tends to be a little bit more self-regulating than those that involve both direct and indirect offsets. Now, um, we all have knowledge gaps. We're all victims of our experience. I do, don't know how the commercial side works, and I know that was uh, you posed your question there. But uh, I'm, as a government guy, I'm always told that commercial side is very efficient and they always come up with the economic outcome that's best value, so I'm sure that happens. Um, but um, those three paradigms, I would mention in my own personal opinion that I think uh, Korean industry, Korean uh, uh, government acquisition officials, Korean government uh, acquisition experts, um, both in development, production, and support. Korean industry is uh, certainly uh, has the uh, competitiveness and the quality to, to be able to compete in today's global marketplace, hopefully with fewer direct offsets, uh, maybe trying to minimize those. I found Mr. Yi's comments very insightful because, as we all know, if uh, you have to do something that you didn't used to do, that's a learning experience. He mentioned that. And um, uh, defense acquisition uh, policies and practices are, are more like uh, ships than fighter airplanes. They, they take a long time to turn, and uh, you may uh, provide some uh, rudder, uh, but it, it, uh, the, you're not going to do a... Uh, 360 barrel roll right away. It takes a, a while to turn that ship. So hopefully um, we're making progress along those lines on both sides, government and industry, towards a uh, more uh, efficient and economic uh, approach to work sharing and offsets. Um, other questions? We have a few minutes remaining. Yes, we have. I, I can kind of bear, I'm 61, so I can say. <laughs> Please, no please pose your question. Sure. Hi, uh, Lee Jung Greco again, Flight Global. Um, back on KFX again, if I can. Uh, can you address any challenges uh, specifically with that program? The minister mentioned uh, they're pursuing um, future offsets with that. And as I understand it, it's for lower technology uh, for KFX. So. Regarding KFX project, you raised a question, but none of us is qualified enough to give you an answer regarding KFX. It's because
none of those who are directly involved in the project are attending the seminar. So if it is deemed necessary, I'll be happy to return home and uh, verify the facts and get back to you with information. Other questions? Um, yes, please. Um, Jion Park from DAPA. My question goes to Mr. Hartwig. Um, you mentioned that AIA is putting an, its effort in pursuing blanket um, program licensing. This is exactly what the Korean government or Korean defense industry has been asking the US government to consider. Um, could you share with us any progress so far made or your prospect uh, on the initiative? Sure. So we initially uh, talked about a, a program license with the U.S. government a number of years ago, and um, through a variety of personnel changes, it, the program or the concept was moved to the back burner. Uh, recently, we have found that there is some receptibility within the U.S. government about pursuing something like this. Um, with I let me provide also a giant caveat and that caveat is that we're going through a presidential transition and so while we're going to continue to pursue the concept of a program license uh, the, the the example for my friends from Lockheed Martin is on the F-35 uh, the the concept there is uh, perhaps you can provide a program license for that particular program uh, but the presidential transition may you know, for, like all things in the U.S. government, may slow some things down. So we will see how how that turns out. But it's something that we're going to continue to actively pursue. A, a brief mention that um, I was one of the ones that worked on the program license initiative about ten years ago with AIA. And uh, uh, well, I, my vision is is failing. My uh, recollection is still pretty good. So. Um, we at DAU would be, you know, happy to continue to support uh, OSD and, and industry in that regard because um, it was our belief at the time, and it remains my personal belief that that could be a very productive approach to uh, improve uh, licensing performance while uh, maintaining the technology security that uh, the U.S. government and DoD is looking for. So thanks for that. Frank, your reach continues to be long and deep in program licensing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I won't reintroduce myself. Uh, we've heard a little bit so far today about uh, cooperation in R&D and also about production and I even to assembly. Uh, the one topic we haven't really touched on as much is on the uh, operation and sustainment market, which generally speaking is the largest part of, of the revenue stream with any given system. So I would just be interested in the panel's reflections uh, on the opportunities in that market uh, for cooperation, collaboration between the U.S. and the Korean industry. Well, I'll start. Um, <clears throat> Northrop Grumman has uh, an, a number of programs they're pursuing in, in Korea, and in each of those cases, we're looking for opportunities to bring the sustainment and maintenance of, of those items that we're working with the government of Korea on into the Korean industry realm. Uh, it is a more effective, more efficient way to do that. Uh, but that, again, is governed or, or um, our ability to do that is controlled by the U.S. government. It's all about licensing. And, you know, that, that would mean that it would be a very good partnership for the DAPA side to reach outside of their boundaries at times to look at the services and maybe even U.S. Forces Korea for advocacy to be able to do those kinds of things that maybe technologically might be restricted. Um, so looking for maintenance in country is a great opportunity to grow capability and capacity. Uh, we support that 100%. Let me just obviously associate my comment myself with, with Rick's comments. That's absolutely true. The other thing I want folks to remember from a basic economic standpoint is about economies of scale. So the more suppliers you can find within a geographic region that buys down the cost associated with that 
uh, with those supply with those suppliers is going to be important in encouraging uh, the development of a, of the industry around it itself. Um, I do think that a government to government conversation about that is is really in the offing in order to um, really realize the potential of of uh, parts and suppliers. Um, but you're right, it's not only uh, Northrop Grumman, it's also Boeing, especially on, on commercial aircraft. Those are really large opportunities that um, the sector can take advantage of. One more quick item. Uh, a related item, uh, being part of the supply chain. So in addition to sustainment and maintenance of, of uh, aircraft and ships and tanks and trucks, uh, the the review of opportunities to enter the U.S. supply chain, I think, is not as robust as it should be. Uh, if the Korean, if DAPA made that a part of their, if the energy was moved from the offset world into how do we enter the U.S. parts manufacturer and uh, supply chain world, you would see a more natural flow of partnerships develop. Uh, as Korean firms are all ISO certified, for the most part, they all have a very technologically skilled workforce. Uh, they maintain prices at a pretty low rate. Uh, it's a great opportunity, I think, for Korean industry to participate, except that it requires some knowledge of opportunity windows when parts and pieces come open for competition within U.S. industry. Well, when it comes to uh, cooperation in the defense industry, our two nations will have to uh, reach a win-win. That's my firm belief. And when it comes to Korea, when we cooperate with third countries, that should form the, a basis. And that does form the basis as we go forth with uh, cooperation, whether we are an importer or an exporter. I think the same principle does apply. The country that runs this weapon system the follow-up and regarding the life cycle sustainment and etc they need to be equipped and support needs to be provided that's the key and that's the fundamentally required aspect and that country if they can perform domestic domestically driven acquisition they should be allowed to do so because it really shows real trust and the real basic concept of defense industry and its cooperation. However, when it comes to key components and technology transfer of key strategic assets involves licensing other security risks, so that should be set apart. But my key uh, conviction is this, that the nation should be uh, provided with support so that they can go ahead. That's my firm belief. That's, uh, those are some great observations at the end. When I was in OSD, we used to call operations and sustainment the gift that keeps on giving. If you can find a way through either government to government cooperation, which is possible, we have cooperative multilateral arrangements on, with other nations on C-130 and Apache helicopter and so forth, where those uh, systems were acquired, FMS or DCS, but government to government cooperative arrangements were put in place um, to strive to achieve the benefits uh, outlined by uh, Rick and General O. Um, that might be something worth looking into. Um, uh, and as uh, the general pointed out, um, at the end of the day, if we can um, work together to operate and sustain our forces, then uh, we're all better off. And so let's, uh, I think we'll end the panel with his thought. Uh, thanks so much to our panel members and the audience for uh, a robust discussion on this topic. Thanks. <laughs>